Ryan Gable here with 95XWBEV and DailyDodge.com. You know, I'm not a drinker, but I do have a newfound beverage that I go to. Please don't judge, but here it is. Boom. Metamucil. Keeping everything right in my world. Uh, oh, hey everyone. Kale Zomer from 95X and DailyDodge.com. Here to share with you my favorite quarantine cocktail. I call it the Very Berry Mule. Yes, it's a spin on the Moscow Mule, and I really like it. Just discovered this over the holidays, and it's uh, really good. Got a really good flavor to it and not overly complicated to make if you've got everything you need, which isn't too much, actually. So you're, of course, going to start with the good old Mule Cup. Now you can mix it in something else, in a wine glass or in a rocks glass if you want, but these are definitely the best, and they're not overly expensive. This is a pretty cheap set right here. So we've got our Mule glass and our stir stick. So what I do is I start with an ounce and a half of raspberry vodka. There's where we start with our berry flavor. So we're gonna mix out one and a half ounces of that. And throw that in there. And then we are going to take lime juice. Now, normally I use regular limes and I take about half a lime and squeeze the juice into the cup, but I'm out of limes right now and need to get to the grocery store. So we're just gonna use lime juice, which is fine. Use about a teaspoon, two teaspoons of this couple dashes there got our lime juice in there and then um, I take some mixed berries I've got raspberries and blackberries are really good I like to add some raspberry we already had the raspberry vodka so now we're gonna little add a little depth to the raspberry so raspberries and blackberries they're right there and I just throw them in the cup and then what I do is I Muddle them around just a little bit. I don't muddle them real thick because I don't like a lot of seeds popping up to the top of the drink. But you can also just leave them whole and not muddle them. That's good. Or use them as ice cubes, by the way. If you freeze them, perfect. So you can do it any way you want. So now we've got our vodka, our lime juice, and our raspberries and blackberries in there. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take some ice and fill it most of the way up with ice. Whoop, drop one. All right, so now you can see, got the ice in there, the liquid at the bottom. And then we're going to take ginger beer. Ginger beer, it's important, not ginger ale, ginger beer you want to use. If you use ginger ale, it's going to be too sweet. Ginger is going to be a bit strong. Then you just pour that in and top it right off. Then I'm a big fan of lime, so I'm going to just put a dash of lime juice on the top for good measure. And then I'm going to take a strawberry. There you go. And I've already got a, a little slit cut in there, and we're going to garnish it with that. Uh, if you had a real lime that you were using for the lime juice, you could just take a lime wheel, garnish it with that. But there you go. It's the very berry Moscow Mule, a Zomer specialty. Mm, drink up. Cheers. Hey everybody, this is Wade Bates. I hope you're doing well in quarantine, being safer at home. You know, the one drink that gets me through these long days sheltering in place is a little bit of Captain. Captain always uh, gets you through the day a little bit easier. We'll make this one a double. And we have to add a little bit of my favorite Diet Fago Cola. Drink that'll get you through quarantine. Cheers. Stay safe, everybody. Hi, I'm Leslie Young at 95X. I'm going to show you my favorite go-to shot. I like girly drinks. I'm going to show you how to make the salted nut roll. Three parts rum chata, one part butter shots, a little bit of salt. Super easy to make, super delicious to make. And yes, it converts to an ice cream drink. So for after dinner, ooh, so good. Take a little bit of salt in there. Prost! We're in this together. Mm. Well, Mike, down there at Gene's Tires, time to have the girls shut down the computers. Time to tell the guys out there in the shop, let the hoist down.
Tell your lovely wife to take that big, tall glass out of the cupboard. Tell her to fill that bad boy three quarters of Kickapoo Joy Juice and a little bit of uh, White Lightning, maybe a little bit of Sneaky Pete. Tell her the shop is on lockdown for the weekend. Tell her it's been a long, hard week and that kid is on his way. Team Barn Show! Go. Hello, everybody. After a hard day at the office, another killer morning show, I like to come home and relax a little bit and fix myself one of my favorite cocktails, one I'm sure that you will enjoy. Now, this cocktail that I'm going to fix for you is not super difficult to do. I wanted to do something that was very, very um, tasty, but yet something that was not going to take a lot of time. This is a bottle of bourbon that my, uh, that my daughter bought me for Christmas. So what you're going to do is you're going to take the bottle of bourbon and open it. And this is a fancy bourbon type of glass. And what you're going to do to make this cocktail is you're going to take this bourbon and you're going to pour it into this glass, just like that. You're going to check the bouquet, and then you're going to drink it. I call it bourbon neat. Salute. You know, a lot of people have their favorite beverage, you know, brandy, vodka, gin. But mine happens to be coffee. Good old coffee. It stimulates, it refreshes, and it keeps me on the go. I haven't slept in four days. I tried sleeping on Sunday, but my fingers kept me awake. I'm addicted. Hey everybody, it's Ninja from 95X, and as you can imagine, being quarantined with my wife and three daughters, you can get a little noisy here in the house. So, how do I turn down the volume? With this cocktail recipe. I start uh, making with Irish coffee. Of course, start with a brewed cup of coffee. You can make it strong, you can make it a little weak. I personally like to go with a nice, strong coffee. It's a great way to start off things. I also need to pick my favorite libation, and I go with a little Jim Beam, distiller's cut, a little bit fancier, nice flavor, real smooth, it goes great. Step one, again, brew yourself that cup of coffee. Step two, pour it out. Step three, go ahead and get yourself that libation. Now, depending on how much you want to turn down that volume, you go ahead and add as much as you need. That feels about right. All right, I know what you're thinking. Ninja, I don't drink coffee. I get it, I get it, I get it. You know what? Works with tea. Maybe you don't like the hot drinks. Orange juice, just as good. Milk, yeah, that works too. And you know what, in a pinch, good old glass of water. So, from my home to yours, happy quarantine. Everybody. My name is Mary and I'm one of the bartenders here at Old Hickory Golf Club in Beaverdam. Last May, I had the opportunity to be one of the bartenders at the Beaverdam Area Community Theater Fine Arts Center for the show called One Night Stand with John Mosier and Bill McCollum. It was a great experience and I really enjoyed making drinks for everyone before the show. The show is coming around for round two, which is very exciting. This Friday, May 8th at 7 p.m., Two for the Road will be live streaming on DailyDodge.com. The live stream is free and the radio station will be accepting donations towards the Children's Radiothon. Since I can't make you a drink in person this time, we thought it might be fun if I taught you how to make a drink today and then we can all get our cocktails ready before we sit down on Friday and enjoy the show. The drink that I've chosen is the classic Old Fashioned. I thought it was a perfect pairing with the classic radio legends, John Mosier and Bill McCollum. There's lots of variations to an old fashioned, but I'm gonna be making a classic brandy old fashioned sweet today. To start with, let's take a look at what we need to put this drink together. 
you're going to want to have a jigger. If you don't have one, you can free pour. That'll be okay. You're going to need something to mix the drink up. You're going to need a muddler. You are going to need some bitters. You're going to need uh, some kind of garnish. Today I'm using orange and cherries. And then whatever type of liquor you're going to use, I'm going to be using brandy. And then you're going to need either some sugar or some old-fashioned mix. At Old Hickory, <clears throat> we use a special old-fashioned mix that is made by our bar manager, Deb. Um, it's a secret recipe, so I can't tell you what's all in it, but it's delicious. So let's get this drink started. All right, let's put this drink together. Typically, an old-fashioned goes in an old-fashioned glass, something like this. But today, I am choosing to use the commemorative glass from One Night Stand. I thought that might be fun. The first thing that you're going to do is drop a cherry and a half of an orange into the glass. A couple shakes of bitters. A little bit of your old-fashioned mix or your sugar cube or your simple syrup, whatever you're using. Then you're going to take your muddler and you are gonna muddle the cherry and the orange in the, in the bitters. Be careful not to muddle the rind of the orange too hard or it may give your drink a little bit of a bitter flavor. The next thing you're gonna do is fill your glass with ice. Add your liquor of choice. As I said, I'm using brandy today. A couple more shakes of the bitters. A little bit more of that old fashioned mix. And then you're gonna to top it off with whatever mixer you have chosen. I'm doing sweet, so it's gonna be some sweet soda going in. You're gonna give your drink a stir so all those flavors are mixed throughout the drink. You're gonna add whatever garnish you choose and take a sip. It's delicious, even if I do say so myself. I've enjoyed making a drink with you and I hope everybody can grab a cocktail and enjoy Two for the Road this Friday with John Mosier and Bill McCollum. Until I can see you again safely in public, stay well, everyone. Bye-bye. Your local Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. Hi, this is Daryl and Brenda Shanefeld from Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. We would like to take the opportunity to thank all of our great loyal customers who have been shopping with us during these difficult times. Last, the last couple months have not been very easy, but our customers have been fantastic, being patient with us while we get products on the shelf. And we'd also like to thank our loyal employees for their hard work and dedication. Together, we will get through this. Thank you. Proud to be serving Beaver Dam and the surrounding communities for over 50 years. Welcome to ReachX Food Pride. Your safety is of the utmost concern to us, so you're cart will be sanitized personally at your arrival and also when you leave. We have hand sanitizers located in four locations throughout our store, self check lanes being sanitized in between each and every transaction. Check out the definition of fresh. We receive a produce truck each and every day. Thank you for choosing ReachX Food Pride. We really do appreciate you. Stay safe everyone.
Ladies and gentlemen, here is Good Karma Brands founder and CEO, Craig Karmazin. And WBEV WXRO News Director, Craig Warmbold. And now, please welcome the stars of tonight's show, John Moser and Uncle Bill McCollum. All right, and good evening. Welcome to Two for the Road with John Moser and Bill McCollum. I'm Craig Warmbold, one half of your Craig hosts for this evening. Our other Craig hosts will be along shortly. I want to thank you all for joining us here on this uh, beautiful Friday evening in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Uh, and, uh, of course, introduce the, uh, the two stars of the show here. We've got, uh, well, you don't, need to, you don't need any introductions, but I'll do it anyway. He's been in, uh, in Beaver Dam since 1973. Uh, he's been the, the news director, uh, the janitor, the, the station manager, and... Not sure what it does he does now, but uh, John Moser, and uh, uh, we also wanted some from somebody who's been uh, at WBEV since 1963. Uh, he has uh, he's risen through the ranks. He's uh, he's known simply uh, by uh, two words to many: Uncle Bill, uh, Bill McCollum. Thank you very much for joining us on this two for the road, gentlemen. Thank you. Couldn't hardly yeah. wait. <laughs> And, uh, you know, here we are uh, at the onset of something that was only supposed to happen once. Who right. Who thought? Well, we're going from one night stand to the last stand. <laughs> yeah, I never thought we'd be doing this twice. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> now, now, John's frozen up on but his face froze at about the funniest time that it possibly can. Oh, it's my my internet connection that's unstable, of course, right as we get started, my internet yeah, connection becomes unstable. But um, yeah, uh, because you guys uh, are, are the epitome of technology. So you guys have been uh, hard at work all day, uh, making sure that the, uh, the, the connections and all the sprockets are uh, put into the uh, right receptacles. Uh, and uh, and here we are, ready to go. What uh, uh, what uh, what did you think about the turnout from the one night stand and all of the response that we got last year? I was surprised that uh, it was a sellout. I I thought, why would people want to do this? <laughs> it was, I guess, a lot of fun, and that's why we're doing it again. I was just amazed at the number of people that showed up. As I said. At the one night, uh, uh, what do we call it? The one night stand. <laughs> As we said that night, I didn't think when they first announced this last year for the one night stand, I didn't think we could fill all the bar stools at Heinz Pizza. <laughs> <laughs> bar holds about, uh, I'd say about 15 bar stools. I uh, know, there's only eight or nine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. George has always got one or two of them saved for himself. <laughs> Every once in a while, I run into people that still don't know where Minnesota Junction is. I say, you've never been to Heine's Pizza? Are you crazy? I mean, that's, that's good eating. That's Friday night stuff, man. Uh, when I first got to town, I didn't have any problem finding it, but I did have an issue getting home from Minnesota <laughs> Junction. <laughs> once you were introduced to George Heine's, that was the end. John, tell us about when you first came to town. What year was it? Where were you coming from? What were you doing? What were you thinking? Well, my first job in radio uh, was actually at WSUW in Whitewater. We call it uh, Whitewater Students Unwind with Fabulous Music, WSUW-FM. Uh, my first show was a classical music show. And uh, I basically introduced a song by Bach or somebody or other, and I'd sit there and listen to it for 15 minutes, and then I'd outro it and then I intro the next one and sit so I was on the air about four times an hour after that my first full-time job uh, not full-time but actually paid job was at WBKV uh, and WBKV FM in West Bend the stereo giant in the valley and I did some FM announcing for some of the music there and then uh, a little bit of news on the AM and a little bit of announcing on the AM and my first uh, full-time job was in Tomo, Wisconsin where the I divides uh and then about after about a year and a half up there, it came down to Beaver Dam in March, March 1st of 1973. Wow. And uh, never got a real job after that, been here. 
<laughs> now, Bill, your story goes back even further. Why don't you uh, Why don't you tell us about uh, how you came to Beaver Dam and and those uh, those first days, if you would? Well, I came to Beaver Dam. My first day on the job was Fourth uh, of July, nineteen sixty three. And I got the Beaver Dam job because of Kitty Weber in Sheboygan. I got, fired, <laughs> I got fired in Sheboygan because of Kitty Weber. No, you better stop right now. Tell the whole story, Bill. <laughs> and the one night stand last May was the first time you'd ever uttered that story in Beaver Dam. Is that correct? I think so. Yeah. Should Tonight, I tell the story now? What's that? Right. I tell that story now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I was working in Sheboygan at uh, WKTS, I think, were the call letters. And this was like uh, the early part of 1963. And uh, I did the morning shift and the midday shift and uh, got to know the people at the radio station. And Kitty Weber was, uh, I don't know, a secretary, I guess, at the station. And uh, I didn't have a car. I was making 65 bucks a week and so I couldn't afford a car. So I lived in a rooming house, had one room, no TV, just a radio, and got to know the people at the station. And Kitty Weber said one day, Phil, I saw you walking down the street. Don't you have a car? I said, no. She said, well, would you like to go to have a beer and go to lunch sometime? I said, oh yeah, that'd be great. And so Kitty and I started going out like that. And uh, one day I told her, Kitty, I can't keep doing this. I don't have any money. I can't be running around in the afternoon and can't afford it. I'm trying to save a little money to buy a car. She says, that's all right. I'll, I'll pick you up. I'll, I'll pay for the lunch. And then after a couple of weeks, she told me that her father invented the Weber grill. <laughs> I don't know about right. He invented the Weber grill. <laughs> oh, she had a she had a convertible and she dressed really nice. And after a few weeks, I thought maybe Kitty Weber's grandfather did invent the Weber grill. <laughs> so we're going out for a couple of months. And uh, she lives at home. I live in a one-room house. <laughs> you know, a rooming house. One day she said, hey, Bill, would you like to see the transmitter? <laughs> <laughs> would I like to see the transmitter? Are you an engineer? Do you have a key to the transmitter? She says, don't worry about it. I got a key. <laughs> so she takes me out to the transmitter. Now I'm thinking the transmitter is going to be about as big as an outhouse with a stick sticking up through the roof, the antenna. And we go out to the transmitter in Sheboygan, and it's a big building. And I'm thinking, holy cow, what's this all about? She goes in, unlocks the door. We walk in. God, there's a refrigerator. There's a television. There's a long sofa. <laughs> and not that they didn't have microwave ovens, but they probably had one of those, too. So, <laughs> so we'd go out there a couple times a week. And uh, it went on for probably through the end of June. And uh, one day, Monday morning, Dick McKee, the owner of WKTS, called me into his office. And he said, uh, Bill? Said, yes, sir. He says, uh, have you read the rules and regulations of WKTS? Oh boy, I knew what then was coming. <laughs> yeah, I, I did read the book, Dick. He said, well, you violated the rules and regulations of WKTS. I said, I'm sorry, sir. He said, oh, well, Bill, he says, we're going to have to let you go. My heart just sank and I put my head down. And he says, but don't worry. He says, 20 years from now, I'll probably be working for you. And I thought, yeah, right. <laughs> well, that's how I got fired at uh, WKTS in Sheboygan. And I uh, looked at uh, Broadcast Magazine on the job opening in Beaver Dam. And that's how it all started. Unbelievable. All because you put your hot pocket in Kitty Weber's microwave. <laughs> Who would have thought? 
<laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Ryan, and, Ryan Gable is still trying to find out if Kitty Weber's grandfather invented the Weber grill. <laughs> uh, uh, Craig Carmazin is uh, is joining us. Uh, the the private detective that uh, that you've enlisted to find Kitty Weber. Have we have we made any headway? <laughs> We have not. Um, we don't have uh, those kind of uh, resources given this economy. We had to cut it back. It was initially uh, a big part of our 2020 plans here, but we ended up having to uh, go in a different direction. You know, we've all had to make certain sacrifices due to uh, what's going on in the world right now. Hmm. That's bound to happen. That's bound to happen. Well, Craig, uh, John and Bill were just talking about their earliest days here uh, in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. Uh, and, uh, you know, your earliest days were, you know, were kind of a story in and of themselves, too. Yeah, well, I had a, uh, a good first drive to Beaver Dam, um, <laughs> but it wasn't it, it, it seemed like it was a lot uh, more exciting to me than it was to them, because, you know, I, I show up after, you know, getting into a car accident, ending up in a cow patch having the Dodge County Sheriff uh, drive me to the radio station uh, the first time. But it was like a few months later when I started to talk to them about, you know, what life was like in Dodge County uh, when they were uh, my age uh, and uh, maybe a little later uh, than that, because I was 22 at the time. And they said, oh, yeah, you know, cops wouldn't even bother dri driving us uh, to the station. They'd just pull us over on uh, 151 and tell us to sleep off our uh, our hangover a little bit and just make it into the radio station by 5 a.m. when we needed to sign on. You know, that, that, that was the version of what I got from those guys uh, as, as I was showing up as an impressionable 22-year-old. <laughs> oh, how the times have changed. Now we're impressionable 40-something-year-olds. Bill, Bill, actually, Bill, you used to get a ride to the radio station during winter storms once in a while, right? Yeah. Um, From the that, county. Yeah. My, the driver of the county plow was uh, Ken Longseth. And uh, I think we were short of help that one morning, early in the morning, about five o'clock. And uh, station called to see if I could come in early. And so I got on the phone and called the Dodge County Highway Department. Is there any possible way that I could hitch a ride with a snow plow going from my house to Beaver Dam? And the guy said, well, I'll call you back in about five minutes. Five minutes later, he calls back. He says, hey, we got Ken Longseth going by your house in about 10 minutes. Run out by the road. So I run up, cross my lawn, up the ditch, wait for him. Sure enough, he pulls up, picks me up. And I thought he would take me to Stoddard Street and then drop me off. But no, he pulls on to Stoddard Street, makes a U-turn, and drops me off right in front <laughs> of the radio station. About, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks later, I get a call from Ken Longseth. And he says, hey, Bill, I'm uh, shopping at Rechex Food Pride. Could you stop in in a couple of minutes? I said, yeah, I'll be right down. So I drove down to Rechex. I walked in the store, and there's Ken Longseth. He's wearing a T-shirt that said, I rescued Bill McCullum. <laughs> <It's a snowstorm. laughs> that was pretty cool. That was pretty cool. So Radiothon 2021, we're going to be uh, auctioning off. Uh, I gave uh, Uncle Bill a ride uh, t-shirts uh, <laughs> to, to raise money for. I've only had one of those t-shirts made. <laughs> well, that's what, that one is, uh, where is that shirt right now? I, well, he was wearing it. He was wearing it, so I guess he still got it. <laughs> Sounds like the guy that would give you the shirt off his back, though, at the end yeah. of the day. Yep. I hope the investigation into the uh, the misuse of county dollars didn't cost him his job. <laughs> uh, John, what uh, what's memorable for you when you think about uh, getting to work? Now, when you started, you started in the news department. Uh, you were just a news jockey, a lowly news jockey. <laughs> Um, give us some insight into what it was like back in those days. I mean, did you have a, a memorable news story? By the way, John, before you answer that, do you think when Craig sees you right now, he's like, gosh, I hope that's me like 40 years from now? Oh. Or do you think? Oh, oh. <laughs> I'll save a lot of money on combs and brushes. I know yeah, that. I was going to say, Craig is hoping he's got some hair left 40 years from now. <laughs> 
Um, my, my, the woman who cuts my hair, but not that much. <laughs> uh, I remember my first morning on the air with Bill, and I just remember it being so welcoming. And uh, Bill asked me about my background, and it was just great. And we seemed to hit it off uh, right away at those 7.30 and 8.30 uh, news reports. But, you know. Wait, you, so you were on that, that exact slot then, 7.30 yeah. and 8.30 news? Well, I did all of the news at that point, but I was also on at 7.30 and 8.30, and that's when Bill and I had time to talk. So, so back we have that. Minute, we have that little creativity that we haven't figured out how to change up the format in 4,800 years since you started. Craig, are you suggesting we're going to flip the EV to adult contemporary? I'm just saying like maybe 725 and 825. Like, I don't know, every, every 30, 40 years, just mix something up a little bit. Yeah, why change? It's a new trivia question every day. Is, uh, actually, I think it's a new, like, I think they're only new like once a month, but just like uh, these guys don't even realize, John doesn't realize that he's asking the same one, uh, you know. <laughs> There's no need to get a second trivia book. No. Um, you know, there was one memorable news story that I recall from, it was the early days when I was here as well. Um, it Make a long story short, uh, in Juneau, uh, they were taking an inmate from the jail over to the courthouse. The inmate escaped and went into a house along Juno's Main Street and took a woman hostage. Ed Nails was the sheriff at that time. Well, I got word of it and went over to Juno and uh, was in the house across the street where the man had taken this woman hostage. And the woman had cancer, by the way. That's why she was home. Um, and I was watching the whole thing to play out. It was very a very, very cold day in the winter months. I forget which particular month it was. But uh, they negotiated with the man through the course of the afternoon and eventually uh, convinced him that uh, they were going to bring in a helicopter for him to escape and that he could come out of the house and eventually get to the helicopter. Well, he came out of the house. He held the woman in front of him uh, with a butcher knife at her neck. He was behind her holding the butcher knife at her neck. There was a sheriff's deputy named Roger Hill at that point. He later became, I think, county treasurer or county clerk of courts. Uh, but he was deputy at that time. He was stationed in the house next door with a rifle. And the man stepped down on the porch step and Roger shot him and shot him dead. And uh, the woman... Uh, ran away and a deputy whisked her away. I came out from across the street and started running across the street. And uh, I'll never forget this, Ed Nails. And a lot of people have a lot of different opinions about Ed Nails uh, over the course of the years. But he uh, ran up the knife that the man had been holding to the woman's neck fell in his own blood, the man's blood. Uh, and Ed Nails picked the knife up, never forget this as long as I live, and he held it up and he said, any other son of a bitch comes into my county, I'm going to do the same damn thing to him. Uh, and I recorded that on a, on a cassette recorder we had at that point, and there was an inquest later on, and I was called to testify at the inquest and asked to play the recording back. Well, because it was very cold, something weird had happened to the batteries. And when I played the recording back, it sounded like Mickey Mouse. <laughs> hey, and, that, and that was also the last time uh, John did hallucinogenic mushrooms, because uh, <laughs> that story can't be verified by anybody else. <laughs> it, that's John. a true story. So, I didn't have the mushroom story here in my notes. Is that uh, that's great? I, uh, but after that is the first time Bill and I went out drinking together, right, Bill? That's right. We went down to Helbing Supper Club and had a I don't know three or four old fashions. So what year is this? This would have been in '73, I believe. Okay. Uh, so right off the bat, you're a you're yeah. a new reporter in Beaver Dam, and within a few months, you've yeah. got this situation unfold in front As of you. As I recall, yeah, that was uh, quite the that really was impactful. I mean. That impacted me personally. I'd never seen a person killed before. And, uh, you know, I think Roger Hill had some issues with that himself uh, after that. Bill, your first year in 1963 
wasn't very different now in retrospect after I hear John's story, which I, I hadn't heard that. Did you, you didn't tell that last year, I don't think. That's the first time I've heard that. Within the first year, you have this serious uh, news story. You see a man killed right in front of you. Yeah. Uh, Uncle Bill, 1963, you start on the 4th of July, 1963. Right. Just a few months later, by November, we, yeah. the, the world's a different. November 22nd, 1963, uh, from President Kennedy was shot in Dallas, Texas, and I was on the air. And uh, when I heard the UPI machine, United Press International, going off, ding, 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 ding. You always knew that was a bulletin coming across. So I ran back to the newsroom, picked off these bulletins, and uh, wow, I couldn't believe what I was reading. And I uh, ran out front where Dick McDermott, the sales manager was. I says, Dick, I'm gonna need some help. You gotta keep uh, picking these bulletins off the UPI machine. I'm gonna need your help. And so he picked off these bulletins and ran them back to me and they were coming back. President Kennedy has been shot and uh, his condition is unknown. And he's being rushed to, I think it was Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas. And so these bulletins, kept coming up with, they kept coming up with updates every five minutes or so. And McDermott is just running back and forth, going crazy, picking up all these uh, bulletins. And finally, this goes on for a better part of an hour. And uh, one bulletin said, uh, Jackie Kennedy, her pink dress is bloodied and uh, we don't know her condition. John F. Kennedy has been rushed to Parkland Memorial Hospital. And a little while later, He's, being, he's in surgery and don't know his condition. Uh, I think governor of Texas was John Connolly back then. And uh, they said John Connolly was also shot by this sniper. And uh, his, un, his condition is unknown. And so this goes on for about an hour. And then about uh, one o'clock in the afternoon, they come by with uh, another bullet and said, John F. Kennedy uh, has expired. And I got this lump in my throat, crying. Can't believe what I'm hearing. And I, mean, <clears throat> I knew I had to gather my thoughts. So I grabbed the national anthem. I slapped it on the turntable. And uh, while well, the national anthem was playing, I'm gathering my thoughts. So we go finish with the national anthem. And I come back on the air. I repeat the bulletin. Uh, President Kennedy has expired. Uh, Jackie apparently is okay. John Connolly is in surgery. His condition is unknown. So when my shift was over, I was wiped out. I mean, totally exhausted. I walked back to my one room housing unit that I lived in. And I laid on the bed, uh, listened to the radio. And this is on a Friday. And about seven o'clock that night, I said, God, I got to get the hell out of here. I can't stand this. Where am I going to go? Well, I decided to go up to the satellite bar. That was my hangout. Satellite bar was right across from uh, Beaver Dam Bay Marina. It's where Jumpers is right now, still a bar. And uh, I'm thinking, I'll go out there and I'll drown in my beer just like all the other people. So I get out the jumpers or out to uh, the satellite and park my car and I walk in and holy cow, I couldn't believe it. The parking lot is full of cars, the jukebox is playing. And my kids are all dancing. I stop it right in front of the door as a what the hell is going on here? Doesn't everybody feel like I feel? I turned around and walked. I went back home. Laid on the bed till Saturday morning. And the rest of the weekend is pretty much a... I uh, can't remember what happened except Lee Harvey Oswald ended up Sunday getting shot in the basement of the Dallas, Texas Police Department. But I, I, It just amazed me that everybody... It was like nothing ever happened. Life going on, despite we just lost the president of the United States. Never forget that.
Unbelievable. Your first years for both of you guys to have such, uh, such huge experiences uh, during that, that first year together. Did that bring you closer together? Would you say? Probably did. I mean, I don't know. Well, we weren't that. together at that point. Oh, this no, was no, right. Three. I came in 73. I jumped right, over right. to 73. If you're still yeah. doing the math, yeah. sorry. Yeah, so when, the, the, no, John, when you were in 73, did you say, I can't believe this is happening my first year. And Bill said, Hey, <laughs> you, you wouldn't believe what happened my first year. <laughs> oh, Bill said, let's go out drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, I look back at my first six months with uh, WBEV and I thought, good God, here I've only been at the station four months and the president gets killed and I'm on the air. I just couldn't believe it. Well, it's amazing when you think about uh, the history and it's so unique to Beaver Dam to have uh, these two guys uh, together and the way they've been honored uh, over time uh, in the community, the impact they've made. Uh, recently being named Legends uh, together, the first duo ever named Legends together by the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association. But there's another duo that I just want to give some love to tonight, which are the two grocery stores uh, in our community, um, Gilmore's Piggly Wiggly and Rechex Food Pride. Um, it, it's, it's important you know, to think about these tough economic times and how you know, those businesses have been together, you know, and in our community through it all. And I remember the last time we went through a struggle like this in 08, 09, and there was competition uh, coming to town that everyone was worried was going to put them under. And it's just so cool, you know, and we see communities all over the country. You don't see something like that in Beaver Dam. You know, those two stores willing to sponsor an event like this together tonight. And I know Bill and John, you guys are both so close, uh, each with one of the stores. Uh, and I know uh, you both love them both, but um, it, it's, it's just really cool, you know, to have that. And I think that's one of the things that makes Beaver Dam so different, you know, locally owned stores like that, you know, operated by great operators who care about their community. Yeah, if I can add to that a little bit, you know, you, you just mentioned briefly competition. Uh, when Walmart uh, came to Beaver Dam, the history of Walmart up to that point had been when they came into town with a, a big box store like they have here with groceries in it, that at least one grocery store in that community would go out of business. And uh, we are very fortunate, like you said, Craig, to have two extremely good operators uh, who shepherded their stores through that by offering great products, great service, and we still have and investing people. and investing in their stores to yes. you know to even take them to another level to differentiate yes. themselves from what that competition was going to be. Both of them have ex have expanded, absolutely. And it's great to have them uh, with us. And uh, I've I've called on uh, Piggly Wiggly and Beaver Dam for many years, and uh, Bill called on. Uh, Brett and Brett's dad for many years over at Rechecks, right, Bill? Well, I remember uh, when uh, Jerry Recheck bought Lauer's Food Store. And uh, I thought, well, as soon as they open, I'm going to go over there and talk to Jerry Recheck and try to get him on the air. He beat me to the punch. He calls me about three days before they open the store. And he says, Bill, I got to do some advertising. Come down and see me. And I thought, McCullum, you dumbass. Why in the hell did she do Jump in there right away. <laughs> Jerry believed in advertising. Ron Lauer believed in advertising. And I dropped the ball there. And I never forgave myself for that. And then Brett Recheck has taken over from his dad. And uh, we have a wonderful relationship. And I tell you, I wouldn't want to be in business without these guys on my team. Great. I, I started calling on uh, uh, Piggly Wiggly when it was owned by uh, Doug and Bonnie Gilmore who have both since passed away. I knew the current owner, uh, Daryl Shainfeld, and uh, I knew his wife, uh, Brenda, when she worked out by Master Print on uh, De Clark Street. Uh, but uh, I remember working with Daryl when he was the manager uh, for Doug and, and Bonnie, and um, it's been an honor to work with he and Brenda through these many years. Yeah, they're just fantastic partners. Uh, Brett Rechak called me last week. And uh, he said, because I had him on the barn show doing a live commercial. And he calls me up that night and he says, hey, Daryl would like to do the same thing. 
<laughs> well, we're going to do that next week. I, I, I knew Daryl's dad, Verlin Shanefeld, uh, because I, when I came, I was the news guy and I would cover Beaver Dam School Board. And Verlin was uh, on the Beaver Dam School Board for, for many, many years. Oh. And uh, yeah, so it's great to have these two local people who, you know, are, have real roots in the community uh, running these local businesses and doing such a great job at it. And, and all the people who work there you know, through all these times when people don't want to go outside and don't want to do things, you know, they're the yeah. ones who are going in there every day and restocking shelves, taking care of people and, you know, just doing an amazing, amazing service uh, to, to their community. So I, I, I thank uh, them and the, you know, the owners of the stores, but all of the people who, who work at, at those two stores who've, uh, who've been incredible uh, over the last few months and uh, the last 20 plus years that I've been around. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I told Brett uh, the other day too, I thought the commercial Brett did, and maybe some people heard it, uh, where he talked about the way he and Daryl had worked together uh, when this uh, COVID-19 came along and talked to each other about what to do and how to handle things. And, you know, that says a lot about a local community and two great owners. Sure does. And on that note, why don't we uh, see one of those uh, commercials here? We'll take a break. Uh, our uh, main sponsors are Beaver Dam, Piggly Wiggly, and Rechecks Food Pride in Beaver Dam. Not very often that you have two competing businesses <laughs> as figureheads on the same event, but I mean, that just goes to show uh, how special Beaver Dam is. So uh, we'll take a break. Uh, Uncle Bill, uh, John Moser, uh, Craig Carmazin, and myself will all be back here in just a few minutes. Your local Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. Hi, this is Daryl and Brenda Shanefeld from Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. We would like to take the opportunity to thank all of our great loyal customers who have been shopping with us during these difficult times. The last, last couple months have not been very easy, but our customers have been fantastic, being patient with us so, while we get products on the shelf. And we'd also like to thank our loyal employees for their hard work and dedication. Together, we will get through this. Thank you. Proud to be serving Beaver Dam and the surrounding communities for over 50 years. Welcome to Rechex Food Pride. Your safety is of the utmost concern to us, so your cart will be sanitized personally at your arrival and also when you leave. We have hand sanitizers located in four locations throughout our store, self check lanes being sanitized in between each and every transaction. Check out the definition of fresh. We receive a produce truck each and every day. Thank you for choosing Rechex Food Pride. We really do appreciate you. Stay safe, everyone. And we're back here, two for the road. I'm your co-host, Craig Warmbold, alongside Craig Karmazin, the CEO and founder of Good Karma Brands. And of course, the two stars of the show, John Moser, Uncle Bill McCollum. Uh, he would be the uh, the clear white screen. Uh, in one <laughs> here he comes. <laughs> of, of I want to city. ask Bill about this, uh, you know, this whole COVID-19 thing, because for a lot of us, this is the first time uh, we've been dealing with this, but Bill, do you remember uh, back when they cured polio? I feel like you were around for that, right? What, what was that like? I remember getting the polio vaccine, but I don't remember. I remember my grandma, my grandpa, and my mother talking about how bad this stuff was. and But that's about all I really remember about it. I remember uh, the iron lungs that uh, people had polio would be in that would breathe for them. Um, and I remember as... Uh, I don't know what grade we were in, but we all got all hauled from Allenton over to Hartford to Marty Zifko's ballroom to get vaccinated for polio. That was a huge uh, deal. You even remember the goiter pill, don't you? Yes. We <laughs> no, I don't think we ever had to take goiter, goiter pills. Goiter. Really? Yeah. It was, uh, when we were in grade school, the nuns gave us goiter pills every week. Mm. They didn't taste real bad. <laughs> they were pretty awful, <laughs> and I have no clue what the hell, uh, what the heck they were for. I don't either. I don't either. Goiters. Do you know where your goiter is, Bill? I think it's in my left arm. 
<laughs> Take a strange turn. I got a uh, I got a text during the break uh, from a friend uh, that noted that my glass was uh, empty, so I refilled it. That that, that friend was uh, is uh, Paul Hartle, who is um, there. There you go. Cheers to you, Greg. Uh, Paul Hartle, who is the uh, the uh, the nephew of uh, Chris Hartle. And I, Paul, I apologize if I got the uh, the family lineage there. Uh, so many people have uh, have oh. come through the halls of uh, Good Karma Broadcasting, and before that, uh, WBEV, uh, WXRO, and and John Klinger. Uh, certainly, though, uh, Chris Hartle is one that I know you remember, Craig. Oh yeah, and you know when I uh, when I came in in '97, I guess there were four of you, and I I don't think I'm missing anyone who had been around. 25 plus years at the time because craft craft wasn't around that long right you know at that time so it was the two of you uh chris hartle and then warren jorgensen wasn't far off from uh where you when you guys uh when you guys started right when john when you started right yeah i think he started about 75 or 76 yeah i mean so that is uh it's impressive but chris hartle so what did she start as like the girl Friday or what was that called back in the day? Bill, you were there earlier than me. I remember Chris working part-time when she was in high school. And then after high school, she jumped in full-time and she did just about everything at the radio station. She was the bean counter. She uh, could write copy. She could do everything. The most amazing thing was, you know, when I came in in 97, I couldn't believe it. Like, you know, cause she was the bookkeeper. Yeah, That was her title was bookkeeper, but I didn't know a bookkeeper still at that time would be keeping it with books. Like <laughs> she, she didn't have a computer to do her accounting work. She had this big computer sitting on her desk and then all of her accounting was done next to it in these big books. <laughs> and so I said, this, we can't, this, this, we can't run a company like this. You know, it's going to be 2000 soon. So we, we bought QuickBooks, got all the uh, computer things uh, going on. And it was, um, you know, 11 years later uh, that she passed away. And so she had basically been our office manager and keeper for 11 years. And I went, uh, you know, I figured out oh, it'd be, you know, interesting to pull out these books and see, you know, because she had stopped doing the books in 1998, you know, as we got the new computer system online. And what I found out was for that following 10 years, she was still doing all the books in the books and then just transferring the numbers over to the program and not letting it, and not doing any of the work on the computer that I'd gotten her. Wow. So uh, she yeah. was, she was old school and uh, she was, um, she was uh, amazing. And, uh, just amazing and a good friend. Chris is actually the reason I'm in Beaver Dam. Uh, really? I had heard there was a job opening in Beaver Dam. And uh, I was working in Toma at the time, and I called Beaver Dam, and Chris answered the phone. I said uh, my name, and I said, I understand you're looking for a news person, a news director, and I'm interested in the position. And Chris said, well, you know, John Klinger just hired somebody else yesterday. So, you know, the normal receptionist or whoever answered the phone would have said, well, that's it, you know. But Chris said, I'll let you talk to him anyway. So I talked to John. And um, we decided to meet. I drove down from Toma. There used to be a restaurant right off the uh, interstate over at Portage. We met at a small restaurant over there. It's closed now for many years, I guess. Wait, now, why would he want to meet with you? What was your resume at this point? I had a job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think you could get WTMB down here. Maybe he, had, he listened to me, whatever the case was. And we met and I hornswoggled him and he hired me and let the other guy go. Well, that was wow. like when Bill, uh, that was like when Bill quit, right? And they replaced him uh, for a few days. And then they, once Bill wanted to come back, they got rid of the guy. And that would happen with Bill also. Yeah, you were going up to Wausau TV, weren't you, Bill? Yeah, I, I took this job at the Wausau TV station, but I was divorced at the time. And I had a little girl living in Beaver Dam. And after I took this job, I... Well, I had a lot of remorse. I thought, God, I don't want to see my little girl once a month. I want to see her all the time. And so uh, 
I thought about it for a week and I had given my two weeks notice to Tom Fail, the manager of WBEV. And I said, I, I can't take this job. So Tom Fail, he did a country and Western program from five until six o'clock at night. And then he'd go to Max Tip Top and have a bar, have a beer. And uh, so one night I got up enough guts to go over to uh, Max Tip Top and ask for my job back. By golly, he gave me my job back right there, sitting on the bar stool. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I had, well, I had sellers. I had a lot of remorse about taking that job at Wausau and glad I didn't. So, so how many people did you guys pack into uh, that theater, that new theater for uh, the one night stand when, when you guys did this the first time? I don't know. I heard 250. Yeah. Well, I, I just got it three, 350. I just got a text that there are over three times that watching this right now. Wow. Wow. We probably could have done really that. really bored. <laughs> They're looking for something to do. <laughs> probably could have done a whole weekend stand last uh, last year with this. You guys were a more in-demand ticket than the Rolling Stones. <laughs> that I mean, we, we spent a lot of time talking about the grocery stores, but how about this community and how how closely bonded uh, you guys feel with them and, and they with you, you know, like gen multiple three generations now on, on some levels have, have basically grown up, you know, with you guys as a constant and you, you saw them when they were little kids and then you saw them go away and come back and have their own kids. I mean, it's pretty cool. I mean, not many people get to get to see a community through the lens that you two have. I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me and said, you know, when I was a little kid, uh, the only time I listened was when you guys had school closings on. <laughs> My mom and dad would put you on the radio, and then I would be happy when they announced that the school was closed. But this community, the whole Dodge County area is really, I think, and everybody says is about every place, but it's so special. It's been so good to be. I remember so John, by the way, do you still do you still hit on do you still hit on her when she says she remembers listening to you for school closings, or do you realize that's inappropriate? <laughs> it's inappropriate. No. <laughs> uh, so I lost my train of thought, Craig. It's your turn, Bill. <laughs> I, I remember you know talked about uh, good partners over all these years. When I first came to town. I uh, was not in sales, but after Ron Stebbins, the sales manager, left, he introduced me to uh, Tooney Zondag from uh, the Jung Garden Center. And Tooney was a guy that uh, he did a five-minute program three or four times a week on WBEV, and he'd give uh, garden tips, just like the garden doctor uh, Dick Zondag does now. Dick is Tooney's son. And uh, so Tooney and I really got along really well. And uh, he would start his program out with little uh, stories like, uh, this is Tooney from Jung Garden Center in Randolph. A house without a tree ain't fit for a dog. <laughs> he enjoyed to his tips. And then, uh, the next time he'd come on, people started really listening for these little intros. And uh, he'd come on and say, this is Tooney from Jung's Garden Center in Randolph. Don't plant a garden any bigger than your wife can take care of. <laughs> <laughs> so back, back in 1965, there was a lot of political correctness talk. <laughs> well, people love that guy. God, they love Tooney Zondag. And uh, Dick Zondag, his son, now does the Garden Doctor program every Wednesday morning at 1030. And uh, Dick, brother Bob, also sits in when Dick is at a Milwaukee Brewers game or out of the state or traveling. So uh, now partners like that, good grief. I mean, it's just incredible. Countryside GM Auto Group. First time I ever said there was no uh, political correctness, uh, Bill. What was it like in the radio station, guys, in the 70s? Was it like, you know, WKRP in Cincinnati or people chasing... Uh, you know, having inappropriate relations, like what's, you know, take us behind the scenes because we know in the good karma world in today's day and age, everyone is professional and we're all doing things the right way. But 
What was going on behind the scenes at a place like that in the 70s? We started the professionalism trend. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I know people are amazed today to know how much we used to smoke around the radio station. You used to be a smoker years ago. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. There was an ashtray in every room. Yeah. Would you be smoking on the air? Oh, yeah. Yes, yeah. Paul Ryan was the, he was the uh, program manager when I came to Beaver Dam. And uh, Paul never tied his shoestrings. And we always had had cigarettes burning. I mean, he was a chain smoker. He had cigarettes burning in every room. And one day, and he was always late, he'd run down the hallway and shoes or shoestrings are flying. And one day we were up above Camrats in downtown Beaver Dam in Front Street. And uh, Paul sales turned the corner and he fell down the steps. He stepped on the shoestrings. And, uh, but, you know, back then he, everybody smoked. I mean, everybody smoked. I've got a great smoking story about covering the elections in Juneau. Oh, at Waldy Miller. Waldy Miller. He's a county clerk. Wow. So my job was covering the county uh, results on election night. I go to the courthouse and uh, we're all sitting around a big table and everybody's smoking. I'm smoking, everybody's smoking. All these little town newspapers, all these people are smoking. Waldy Miller, the county clerk, he joins us, he's smoking. And uh, Bill Pritchard from the Daily Citizen, he's smoking. But these two guys, Bill Pritchard, and Waldy Miller, they're smoking cigars. Everybody else is smoking cigarettes. <laughs> Telephone would ring, and we'd all run to the results table, get the results, call this radio station, call the newspaper, and read the results, then file back in around the big round table. And this happened for like three or four times that night. And everybody comes back into the main office, to the main round table. And uh, Wally Miller sits down, and uh, Bill Pritchard sits down. Bill Pritchard picks up a cigar, and he looks at it. He says, hmm. He puts it back down. (laughs) Another cigar says, hmm. He's real puzzled. He doesn't know. I don't know what he's trying to figure out. Finally, he picks up the other cigar again, and he says, oh, what the hell? These looked like... My teeth marks. <laughs> <laughs> that soggy guitar or that soggy cigar <laughs> through his mouth. I'm like, Richard, I will never, never believe you. I can't believe you did that. But that was, <laughs> those were the days that everybody was smoking. Well, you're uh, you're name dropping, so uh, we should probably name drop somebody that's been a pillar in the community for many years. We ask people to submit questions on uh, DailyDodge.com on our Facebook page. Uh, we have an event page for this, and uh, we've gotten a lot of feedback from people. We're not going to be able to get to them all, but we want to be able to get to some of them. Uh, one of them is. What from- else do these guys have to do all night? We can get to them all. <laughs> <laughs> keep, 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 going. keep the drinks flowing. There's a caveat in case I forgot one. Um, uh, a gentleman that you guys know by the name of uh, Tom Heffron. He's uh, his family oh has hosted Santa Claus for 80 years. Uh, he's uh, recently put together the uh, Beaver Dam area endowment along with several other folks, and they're one of the new Radiothon agencies. By the way, this is a awareness raiser for the Radiothon, which is coming up the third Thursday in June. It's traditional day uh, going on, um, and and uh, we and those 17 agencies are all glad to see that uh, carry on. Uh, but Tom has uh, he's got a question for you. Be, between the two of you, John and Bill, who has talked the most over the years, while Uncle Bill had a few years head start, it might be a tie. Actually, that seems like more of an observation than a question. Um, uh, between the two of you, Bill and John, whose words of wisdom should we best follow to improve our lives in Beaver Dam, Dodge County, and the world as a whole? I would say John Bill. Bill. Oh, Bill. <laughs> you know John's talked more if you count off the air. I feel like Bill doesn't talk much once he gets off the air, right? Right? I mean, John, for for a guy who's uh who's been a radio announcer for 57 years, he doesn't talk that much once he gets off the air. 
Uh, you got him in the right setting. He does. Uh, down at <laughs> Helbing's that first night out drinking, I found out Bill could talk. <laughs> help, help. Well, I am an introvert. You. I am for sure an introvert, no doubt about it. Yeah, you are shy. So, yeah. what do you guys think about the uh, Packers uh, season this year with the schedule coming out? I haven't really followed that. I I don't know what the Packers schedule looks like. I just get a kick out of out of all of these blowhards who really don't know anything speculating about Aaron Rodgers. That's what I get a kick out of. Yeah. Well, uh, we got, uh, we got an interesting uh, season coming up and just uh, interesting to see if they can start on time and uh, which sport will actually be uh, the first one up and running. Uh, Speaking of up and running, um, how about our, uh, our wireless zone of Beaver Dam? Uh, Looks like Monday uh, we'll be uh, back open with the doors. We know we have a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, Verizon fans out there and uh, looks like, uh, you know, we'll be able to get everything, all the proper precautions in place uh, to be able to do curbside service, which uh, whoever thought you'd be able to do that, uh, you know, get your cell phone and never have to leave your car and uh, be able to do everything curbside uh, from the wireless zone of Beaver Dam starting Monday. Well, Craig, you brought up the uh, the Packers. I don't know if you have any insight into the world of the NBA, but uh, what are your thoughts about the possibility of an NBA season continuing while we're on the subject of sports? Well, it's amazing. You know, the last time we were all together for this one night stand, it was right in the heart of uh, the playoffs, right, for the Bucks, And everyone was so excited. And we were talking about how different that was, you know, than most of our time in Beaver Dam, that, you know, the Bucks were – you know, I guess they trained in Beaver Dam when they started, right, Bill? Were, were you yeah. guys both around for that? Oh, yeah, I was. Well, I, I got a story about the Bucks. Yeah, go ahead, Bill. That's before my time. Yeah, this was uh, like 1965, mid-60s, late 60s. Uh, Ray Patterson, who was the president of the Milwaukee Bucks, he uh, was also president of Wayland Academy. And... In the summertime, when he would go to Milwaukee every day because he wasn't at Wayland, he would fill up his car. He had a big car, but I don't know if he had a a phobia about going below half a tank or what, but he would fill up his gas tank every morning, Monday through Friday, at uh, Lund Super America. And I'd go in there and pick up a donut and a cup of coffee in the morning, and so I got to meet Ray Patterson that way. And uh, one day... Ray said to me, he says, hey, Bill, why don't you have your boss, Tom Fail, give me a call. So I go back to the station, tell Tom Fail to call Ray Patterson. He calls Ray Patterson and Ray says, hey, Tom, we're going to bring the Milwaukee Bucks to Wayland Academy Fieldhouse to do an exhibition game between the Bucks and the Cincinnati Royals. Tom says, that sounds great. And uh, Ray Patterson said, do you think you guys could sell that game? Tom Fail says, yeah. So when Tom, uh, Ray Patterson said, oh, one more thing. I would like to have Bill McCollum be the play-by-play, <laughs> be the play-by-play guy. And I thought, when Tom Fail sprung that on me, I thought, are you crazy? I've listened to Eddie Doucette, the current play-by-play guy for the Bucks, and he's fantastic. I, I would be embarrassed to do that. So I told Tom Fail what I just said. So he told me, gave my message to Ray Patterson. Ray says, that doesn't make any difference. We want Bill to be the play-by-play. Eddie will be his color man. Oh, my God. <laughs> Eddie, you set my color man? Are you nuts <laughs> or what? <laughs> I eventually agreed to do that. And pro basketball is probably three times as fast as high school basketball and I'm apologizing the whole game to Eddie I said Eddie I'm very sorry God I'm I'm so I'm sorry I'm embarrassing myself he says no you're doing fine you're doing fine and one of the nicest guys in sports that had a big name that I ever met Eddie thanked me for letting him sit in on the ball game and uh, you know there was uh, that was when uh, Ray Patterson had drafted uh, Lou L. Cinder, who later became Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So he was there at that game. And then 
I believe it was Ray Patterson that traded for Oscar Robertson of the Cincinnati Royals. He was there. So, you know, looking back, that was a hell of an honor. That was pretty damn nice of Ray Patterson. Yeah. And, and I have to say, Bill is a very good play-by-play -play announcer for basketball, baseball, the whole ball of wax. Um, my well, record. I, I know the NBA isn't as big, you know, wasn't as big then, but does it, did it seem as crazy as it does now to think that the Milwaukee Bucks would be playing a game with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or Lou Alcindor and Oscar Robertson in Beaver Dam? Or did that just seem like a normal occurrence at that point? I think it seemed pretty normal. Yeah, it was not a big a deal. It was a lot of fun. Thank you, Ray. Yeah. Eddie Bissett was a, a rock and roll DJ as well. And I think it was on WRIT, right, Bill? Right. In Milwaukee, yeah. there were two rock and roll radio stations back then, WOKY and WRIT. Mm -hmm. And Eddie, I remember listening to him laying in bed on Sunday night with my transistor radio doing a show, the Silver Dollar Surveys, from some go-go club in downtown Milwaukee. Yeah. He was a big guy. He was, oh, you yeah, no doubt. Big name. Well, getting back to the Bucks for just a minute. Uh, John, you remember when Don Nelson, coach of the Milwaukee Bucks, came to Beaver Dam? On a tractor? Yeah, yeah. They were doing a fundraiser for farm something. Uh, it was a farm event, raising money for farmers. And uh, John Klinger told us one day that uh, Don Nelson was going to be driving a tractor into Beaver Dam. And uh, they're pulling into Tubby's Bar, which was owned at that time by Tim Fletcher. And... Uh, he says, uh, we're going to do the ball. That was okay. And then uh, Klinger tells me that Don Nelson is going to do the barn show with me. I thought, what? The coach of the Milwaukee Bucks, he doesn't know a polka from a rock and roll song. He's not going to want to do this. Don Nelson, he was all in favor of it. He coached the Bucks for like 11 years. And uh, he came into Tubby's and we did the barn show. I, I uh, introduced one polka. He introduced the next polka. Went back and forth for an hour, hour and a half. It was a lot of fun. At the end of the program, Don uh, Nelson came up to me and says, damn, he says, I love those polkas. I love polka music. I said, Don, you don't know polka music, do you? He says, hell yes, I grew up in Iowa just like you did. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Don you know where he is now, right? You know what Don Nelson's doing uh, right now? Oh, he's smoking a lot That's of pot in Hawaii doing. right now. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll ask he's John and Bill about all the pot they smoked. But first, we have to take a break. <laughs> Good, I need a drink. <laughs> the, you know, it's it's funny. I thought uh, I thought I was going to be the color guy, and Carmazin was going to be the host, but he <laughs> wound up signing on a few minutes late, so I got thrust into this position. You know, and because he signs my checks, I didn't want to correct him when he said Gilmore's Piggly Wiggly. Uh, I mean, I, I was just going retro. I mean, <laughs> I'm sure, I'm sure Brett Darryl, and Jody got Darryl, a big kick out of uh, Daryl and Brenda. <laughs> Darryl, I mean, come on. Daryl has respect for them. He loved it. He loves hearing that name uh, there. Um, <laughs> throwback. It's, it's throwback Friday here on uh, dailydodge.com. Uh, you're watching uh, two from the road, uh, John Moser, Bill McCollum, uh, <laughs> Who from the road is about correct? <laughs> Did I say two from the road? Me, how about me being the only one to make an old reference that was incorrect? If you had guessed <laughs> that one of the one of those guys would have made an incorrect reference because they're old, I was the only one making wrong references because I'm old. <laughs> two on the road, two do, do the road, whatever it is, uh, we're we're calling this. Uh, we're going to take a break uh, and uh, be back here in just a few minutes. Your friends at Dentistry of Wisconsin want you to know they are thinking of you and wish you good health during this unprecedented time. They look forward to seeing you again soon, but until then, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Anderson Real Estate is a proud sponsor of tonight's show. For all of your real estate questions, just ask Bev. She'll make sure to get you the right answers. Go online at bevanderson4realestate.com to learn more. Enjoy the show. Pine Hills Trucking is a proud member of the community and they feel fortunate in these challenging times to be able to keep their trucks on the road so everyone can continue to get the supplies they need. 
Pine Hills Trucking is pleased to sponsor this fun event. The Shores on beautiful Fox Lake is open. Carryouts are available Friday through Monday, 4 to 8 p.m. with a delivery to the Fox Lake and Randolph areas. Follow them on Facebook or visit theshoresoffoxlake.com for their menus and specials. Have fun laughing along with Bill and John. Litke Motors in Beaver Dam is available for all your servicing needs. They can even pick your vehicle up from you and drop it back off to you after they've serviced it. Give Litke Motors a call today at 920-887-1661. Now, enjoy more of Two for the Road. Hi, I'm Sandy. I'm Matt. From Higher Insurance. You gotta Oh, it. yeah, from Higher Insurance. And uh, we'd like to congratulate our local legends, radio broadcasters. Bill and John. And remember... When you want to retire, call higher. And we are back. Two for the road. John Moser, Bill McCollum. I'm Craig Warmbold. Craig Karmazin is here as well as we uh, talk to these two veteran broadcasters, 100 plus years between them of radio broadcasting excellence and some not so good stuff too i'm sure in there every once in a while (laughs) so what birthday is this for them combined uh at at the radio station is this like four is it 104 now so it's 73 74 yeah it's got to end in a four right i lost count back in 89 (laughs) So we've got some uh, we've got some stories that uh, we now I've got, I've got the list from last year. So pick the one of these. I'm going to give you three stories. Give me the one that uh, you didn't talk about last year. Live remote at the Roundup Bar. Tom Dome thought he was knocked off the air. And part time Tom story. Is there, or did we cover all those last year? Is there one that we didn't? <clears throat> those are uh, yours, Bill. Part time Tom. Nope, we didn't. We didn't. Part time Tom. All right, let's go with part time Tom then, Bill. I was working in Sheboygan. Tom, I think his last name was Jacobson. He was a high school teacher in Sheboygan and he worked the weekends at WKTS in Sheboygan where I was working. And we were with the mutual network back then. And so we would try to follow the lead in to the news like the mutual network. And so Tom, who thought he knew the intro without reading it, was going to do some ad living on this Sunday morning. He goes on the air from across the. He was supposed to say, "From across the nation, around the world, from where it happens, when it happens, this is the latest news." And uh, well, he thought he knew. He thought he knew the format. He goes on the air, and I can see him in the other room. He goes on. From across the nation and around the world and into the next door neighbor's yard. <laughs> Boom goes the dynamite. <laughs> oh my God. I'm laughing so hard. I leaned back in my swivel chair and I fell over backwards. <laughs> and now he looks in there and sees me laughing. He just turns his mic off and he's laughing his butt off. From across the nation and around the world and into the next door neighbor's yard. <laughs> so he, dusts up, he dusts himself off and it says, Tom, let's do it again. Come on. Do it right this time. He's going through the book trying to find the intro. <laughs> now he's got the intro. He says, from across the nation and around the world and ha 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 again. Uh, I thought for sure the next day Dick McKee would be firing our butts, but Never heard a word about it. So what I was wondering when, Bill, when you were telling the story about uh, Kennedy, would you have a TV in the studio and- Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> you get fired. Oh, I don't know if I was <laughs> them back then. <laughs> so so oh. how about that as that was starting? Were you guys worried you know, to think that 50 years later, People be still listening to the radio when TV was starting. Were you worried? Hey, once everyone has a TV, we no. might be out of here. No, I was never intimidated by that. Never. I was so damn in love with radio that no. I mean, hell, I w- I wanted to be in radio when I was four years old. Yeah, me too. I'll never forget that. I was People- four years old. And my grandma had a big radio. You know, one of these tall radios up against the wall. And when she would leave the room. 
I would move that radio away from the wall to see if I could see a guy behind the radio. <laughs> and I was intrigued by radio way back at four years old. So were you guys ever having like, you know, when you'd hear about radio where they'd have like, they'd act out like the dramas, like, did you guys ever do any of that locally where you did like uh, either the live commercials the way they did with the sound effects? Like, did you, you guys do any of that stuff back then? No, I never. That I was 1950 stuff. Yeah. I never did any of that. Yeah, I, remember but... working, I remember working for my uncle in a gas station in Defiance, Iowa. I was probably eighth grade, ninth grade, in love with radio. And we always listened to Omaha radio stations. And my uncle always listened to the music stations. And once in a while, he'd go downtown and have coffee with the boys. And as soon as he would leave, I would turn the music off and I would dial up some guy talking. Back then, there were no women on the radio. No. And uh, no women at all on the radio. And so I would, I would hear a song come on. I would switch to a station where a guy was talking. I mean, I did that every time my uncle was gone. I wanted to be in radio. Now, John, you were the opposite, right? Bill wanted to be on the radio. You did it because you wanted to get girls, right? That's why you <laughs> said you originally uh, did it? Because you thought that'd make you cool with the ladies? Uh, no, I just wanted to work with Uncle Bill. <laughs> no, come on. What, what made you want to get into radio? I always, for some reason, I just was intrigued by the, I would rem I remember sitting in my, with my mom and dad going to visit my cousins in the 62 Ford Galaxy, uh, telling them to turn the radio up on 920 WOKY so I could hear Bob Berry and Barney Pip and Tony Carr and all those guys talk over doing the post on a record, talking right up to the, uh, to the, uh, to the, uh, where the song started. And I remember um, when I was really interested, I called WOKY up and asked if I could come down for to see what it was like. And I remember I dressed up, I had a suit on and I went down there and saw Bob Barry. Uh, no, it wasn't Barry. It was uh, somebody else working, Gary Price, working in the afternoon, talking up to a, a post on a record. He had a stopwatch there to make sure that he hit it right. It was just the coolest thing on the face of the earth, I thought. And, and so uh, the other thing I thought, once you always told me like back 20 years ago, that once when you left work, you were gonna try to graduate from college, right? You you uh, you, I, still I, a, you still need a credit or two, right? Yeah, I, I left uh, school because I had a few credits to go. Uh, yeah, think, by the way, when you say left, were you asked to leave? No, no. My <laughs> first year, I was asked to leave. <laughs> and actually, I went to Whitewater, and I was down in Whitewater actually when uh, John Belushi was down there. Uh, but uh, and I never met him or saw him or anything. But I did not do well my first year, and I was asked not to come back. I worked at a factory in Ellington uh, for about six months, and I decided that I would rather do something like be on the radio. I remember listening to the radio while I was working on those forage wagons and saying, that's really what I want to do. So I went back to uh, Milwaukee Area Technical College, got my grade point back up, got into Whitewater, went to Whitewater, was within a few credits of graduating but uh, life circumstances uh, took me away. I had a job opportunity up in Toma, and I took it full time. Never got my college degree. And so now, you know, with uh, with being at home during this pandemic, you know, you could uh, you could do it remotely from home. Is this? Are you going to make the big announcement now? I love this being at home. I'm at my kitchen table right now, where we do the morning show from, and it's. <laughs> You know, I come down on my PJs <laughs> and do the morning show. It's great. You can go to the uh, WBEV or Daily Dodge Facebook page if you've got a question <laughs> for John and Bill and uh, what they're wearing when they do the morning show from their kitchens. Uh, we've got a uh, question here from, uh, I just had the name uh, and I lost it. I think it was Gene Steiner. And uh, multiple others have this same Request, tell us a story about Bruiser's Pub. <laughs> John, you want to go first? No, you go first. <laughs> I well, like you how you guys, uh, I like how you guys always look over your shoulder before you decide which story to tell, you know, uh, just uh, to see who's in, uh, in ear's length. 
actually, a lot of people didn't know this. I, I mentioned this last year on stage at the One Night Stand. But, Bill, you were a part owner of Bruiser's Pub. Yeah. Right? Bob Long and Bob Eberly were uh, – Bob Long, a former Green Bay Packer, that was a franchise of Bob Long's, correct? Right, yep. And Bob Eberly, the local guy, started Bruiser's Pub. And the reason it got so popular, I truly believe, was because they had live bands yeah. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday – and Saturday nights. Wait, so where was that? Like on Madison Street? Where was Bruiser's? Monroe Street. Um, it would be on the uh, east side of town, on the southeast side of town, basically. Yep. And there was a restaurant above it that Bob also had called Pasquale's. And uh, the owner of Cousin Subs, Patrice, started out at a very young age being a waitress at Pasquale's. Wow. If you're going east... It's not the kind of story we want, John. We want something with sex, drugs, and rock and roll. If you're going east towards Horicon and you come to Chill Zone, liquor, you yeah. make a right turn, go up one block, and Boo, uh, Bruce's Pub was right there on the left. I mean, especially knowing that uh, Bill had those uh, the keys to the to the manager in the owner's office. Now, now I, I don't I don't know if I'm old enough to hear these stories of what must have been going on there. It, it was. Bill, it was, it was quite the place, and I don't know if there's been a place like it since then. Is it? What do you think? Uh, that was the, that was the place to go in Beaver Dam Bruises. So what what happened to it? I, what the hell did happen to Bruises? <laughs> you owned you owned it. You would think <laughs> yeah. I, so I I eventually uh, sold my interest. I, I I can't remember how it all dissolved. I just think they got away from the live bands and and things just kind of went away but boy for a while there it was it was the place alan van dyke and his band oh, there yeah. four five six times a month yep alan play, was a great local band played all the popular songs yep danced a lot of slow songs to alan van dyke on uh on facebook we actually have three people who are uh nicknamed bruiser who actually want you both to submit to DNA tests uh, just to see if there's a chance. Uh, <laughs> but, uh... So enough of the geography lessons on bruisers. Let's get into the nitty gritty here. Come on, guys. <laughs> no, I, I think I think they've gone uh, where they want to go on bruisers. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Let's uh, let's leave it there, boys. <laughs> <laughs> there's something. All right, then the Corvette story. Are we going to get the Corvette story oh, out of you, Bill? Oh, no. oh, All right, that's no. not happening tonight. <laughs> Well, there is one Corvette story that you told me that when you would go visit your daughter in Chicago, that you'd be reading the newspaper oh. while you were driving. <laughs> I, had, I had to be totally insane. I would leave on a Saturday morning, pick up the Milwaukee Sentinel, and I'd drive down to Chicago, and I'd read that damn newspaper cover <laughs> to cover. I, I look back, and I can't believe I did a stupid thing like that. In your Corvette? Yes. So I picked up my daughter and she would crawl back into the, you know, bring her back to Beaver Dam and she would sleep in the, the back compartment, which was a pretty big compartment. You weren't, you weren't doing the crossword puzzles while you were driving, were you? <laughs> I wonder, you know, I was so stupid. It's a wonder I wasn't. I thought, I thought texting and driving was bad. Uh, that's, uh, this was bad. There you go. This, was, this was bad. Yeah, I do have a, another uh, bar related story. Uh, Back in the mid '60s, um, Tom Fail, the manager, got a call from Orb Middlestead, the manager of the Last Roundup Bar, and the Last Roundup was located on Front Front and Center Streets. It's no longer there. I can't remember what even what's there right now. But anyway, um, Orb Middlestead asked Tom Fail if the radio station could do a live broadcast on Sunday afternoons for polka music at his bar. Tom said, yeah, I think that'd be great. So we went out and sold it. Tom called me in one day and said, hey, you're the announcer for uh, these uh, two hour broadcasts. I said, okay. So we started these broadcasts on Sunday afternoons and Orb Middlestead uh, would always tell me, Bill, sometime during the broadcast, play a song for all the shut-ins in the area, all the people at uh, 
St. Joe's Hospital in Beaver Dam, uh, Lutheran Hospital, Beaver Dam, Wapan Memorial, Columbus Hospital, all these area hospitals. Um, so I would introduce the band's deck song and kept doing that. And Orb says, okay, Bill, next song for all the shut-ins, et cetera, et cetera. And I never looked at my music sheet. Damn, I never looked at what the next song was going to be. <laughs> so I go through that ritual. This is going out to say Joe's Hospital, blah, blah, blah. And the name of this song, and I look at my sheet, <laughs> never get out of this world alive. <laughs> <laughs> and strikes up the strikes up the song, and now I'm dying. I'm just flat out dying. I put my head down, I look over at the bar, and I can't even see Orb Middlestead, the bartender. Where the hell did he go? <laughs> he lifts his head up, and God, he just, he's got this ashen look on his face. I walk over to him, and he says, God, Bill, what the hell did you just do? <laughs> oh, I'm so sorry. That was not intentional. He says, gloss over it. Gloss over it. <laughs> so, uh, how in the hell am I going to gloss over this? So the fact that it's done with that song, and I didn't say a word about that song. I just went into that <laughs> next song. Here's another song by the Push and Bulls. And went into that. But over the years, I've met Orb Middlestead down on Front Street when he still owned the bar. I'd see him out walking around once in a while. He always brought that up. Never let me forget it. God. How wow. about who? who's the most famous uh, person that you ever saw in Beaver Dam? The most famous person that I ever... The most famous saw. person. And and I mean, Lou Alcindor is uh, is pretty good. I mean, that one that one's tough to beat. But any other uh, people who came through town randomly or grew up or dated someone or I who, say, uh, who ended up being famous? I would say probably... Actor Fred McMurray. Yep. Fred McMurray was invited to Beaver Dam by, I assume, the McKinstry family. And uh, Fred grew up in Beaver Dam. And one night I was playing tunes for a wedding at the Pyramid Supper Club. And so I get there about 6.30 at night and unload all these. Back then you had to unload records. You didn't have them in your shirt pocket. You had records. And I'm working my butt off on a hot summer night, unloading all these records, taking them down steps to the pyramid. And the guy opens up the door. He holds the door for me. I got his Fred McMurray. So I was pretty impressed that old Fred was holding the door open for me. And one time, the McKinstry family uh, set up an interview with uh, Fred McMurray. And I was going to interview him. And so I called the number they gave me and his wife, I think his wife's name was June. Yes, it was. It was. And she was an actress as well. I mean, you know, you think of these famous movie actors and actresses, you think that they don't live like you do. But June answered the phone, hey, hello. And I said, hey, Bill McCollum and Robert Am calling. I have a interview coming up with Fred McMurray. And she goes to the door and says, Hey, Fred, come out of the garden. The radio station in Beaver Dam is on the phone. <laughs> About two minutes later, Fred shows up. <laughs> nicest guy in the world. Nicest guy in the world. What about, uh, what about Ric Flair? You guys ever uh, cross paths with Ric Flair, the wrestler, when he was around? Mm -hmm. No, he went to Wayland Academy, correct? Yeah. 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 He went to Wayland, but I never touched base with Ric Flair. The other well, question, the other question I had for you when you mentioned Wapan, any uh, any fan mail ever, anything from uh, the Correctional Institute over there? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah John, you got that story. No, I, well, is there one? Was, I see. I didn't even know there was one. <laughs> it was, it, wasn't, exa it right. wasn't exactly fan mail, but years ago, I used to do the show that uh, Craig Warble does now, Community Comment. And we had a guest on once a month from the Social Security Administration by the name of Joe Brzezinski, just a wonderful guy. Uh, those were the days when um, Joe would have office hours in various communities around the county. 
And he would also visit the prisons. And uh, we were talking one day about various social security issues on the air. And we got into talking about, uh, you know, his prison visits and the like. And all of a sudden, uh, he brought up the fact that he worked with Ed Gein. <laughs> <laughs> I, Craig or War, either of you, Craig, do you know who Ed Gein is? Oh, yeah, sure. And I had stories from Mick McConaughey, the former uh, Beaver Dam alderman who worked in the Department of Corrections and, you know, would casually talk, you know, talk about getting on an elevator and saying, hey, Ed, and his wife would be like, who is that? Oh, you know, Ed Gein. (laughs) Uh, Gein. Why don't you explain for people who don't know who Ed Gein was? He was from Plainfield, Wisconsin. Was he Plainfield? Um, uh, Tony Perkins in, not Tony, Anthony Perkins in uh, Psycho. Oh, yeah. uh, Leatherface from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, yeah. All of these, you know, horror movie characters were kind of loosely based on this murderous wacko from the rural Wisconsin. He made lampshades out of people's skin. Yeah, you know, as yeah. as you would do when you're bored in rural Wisconsin, I'm sure. That was uh, that was uh, Joe Brzezinski's touch with Ed Gein. Uh, most famous person I ever met, as I think about it seriously, Beaver Cleaver. Oh, June Cleaver. Uh, no, oh, not, Beaver. Beaver Cleaver. The Beaver yeah. was in Beaver himself. Yeah, for, uh, I don't know if it was our centennial or sesquicentennial or something, but uh, they arranged for Beaver Cleaver to be in Beaver Dam for that. Yeah. Totally appropriate. Hey, John, you forgot to mention that uh, Ed Gein was a good WBEV listener. <laughs> yeah, oh. you know, Joe did mention that. He did. Yeah. yeah. Is that right? No kidding. Yeah. Is, was well, he in Wapan? Sent him over the edge was uh, that they kept repeating those trivia questions. <laughs> he wasn't to too many one too many wanted shows. <laughs> Which, by the way, we do have four used tires here at the Warmbold residence. If anybody is interested, they are radials. Four digits or four eight two one. <laughs> so from uh, Nate Zank, what about Betty and the bombastic Busca? Any that's comments? Bill. That's Bill's story. Bushkin. Um, she was a big barn show listener. She and her husband, Marv, I used to live next door to them. And then they moved over by Juno. And for some reason, when I gave her the name Betty the Bombastic Bushkin, she loved that name. <laughs> why, would you like, why would you like that name? But she said, I'd go a couple of nights to the barn show without calling her Betty the Bombastic Bushkin. And she'd get on me. She'd write me about that. So that's Betty the Bombastic Bushkin. Judy uh, Hine says, I have so much gratitude to you both for your wonderful reading of my second graders' recipes over the years. Thank you so much. You guys used to read recipes of second graders. No kidding. Absolutely. And, and Bill, Bill read them. He did such a great job on it. And, uh, you know, Judy, Judy's so well known in the community and does a wonderful job with community theater and the show that she puts on. But uh, that was really one of our favorite things of the year, reading those recipes and like, wasn't it, Bill? Yeah, that was a lot of fun. We got a lot of feedback on that. Hey, Craig. Yeah, Bill. I mentioned, uh, I think I mentioned Dick McDermott earlier, uh, sales manager at WBEV. Mm -hmm. Sales Um, manager and prankster. Yeah. Oh, yeah. God, was he a prankster. Um, He was always trying to make you laugh. Always trying to crack up the announcer on the air. Well, back then in the 60s, you didn't try to make the announcer laugh. It was straight radio down the middle, no giggling, no laughing, no shenanigans. But McDermott, he didn't go by those rules. So I'm on the air one day reading want ads and stuff like that. And if I look up and I can see into the newsroom and I can see what's going on in there. So I'm reading away and I look up. McDermott is standing on the table right in front of me in the newsroom and he stuck his finger in his pants down his zipper and out his zipper and he's wagging his finger at me (laughs) oh my god when i saw that i just cracked up i'm laying back in my chair forgot to turn my mic off laughing my ass off god that was funny and all of a sudden i hear boom uh, what the hell's going on? I get up, I look in there. McDermott is laying on the floor. 
he fell off the table. <laughs> Sprained his finger. At me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good thing you didn't do that during the obituaries. <laughs> uh, but that when McDermott fell off that table, that was so damn hilarious. That he, you know, I thought, boy, Dick, I don't know, maybe you're one of those guys that can dish it up and take it, but it was funnier than hell. Was he the sales manager, Bill? Yeah, he was. Well, I had a, a one of our listeners ask uh, for me to ask you about the treasure hunt. Mm. How many do- there? The radio station used to sponsor a treasure hunt yeah. with a great big grand prize if people would find where the treasure was hidden after listening to clues on the radio, correct? Right. Yeah. And I believe now this is back in the 60s. And I think we gave away $500. That was the grand prize. That's a hell of a lot of money. Back then, you bet. Yeah. And so we'd give out these clues very vague clues early on. We try to make this contest run for 13 weeks. And uh, Dick McDermott was in charge of hiding the treasure information. And so as it got down to the 13th week, I mean, it's getting hot and heavy. People are downtown. <laughs> they knew the treasure was downtown Front Street somewhere. And there were hundreds of people looking for this treasure. And the Beaver Dam cops really got concerned because there were people on top of, I think it was Schultz Brothers Five and Dime, which is now Ming's restaurant. People were up on top of the roof looking for that treasure. And the cops went on the air and says, we've talked with WBEV and the treasure is not on a roof. <laughs> you don't have to use a ladder. It's, it's ground level. And after that, the radio station got really scared, and that pretty much brought an end to the uh, to the treasure hunts. Well, what this listener also told me was, Wait, so that, where was the where was the treasure? I can't remember. Dick McDermott did it. To the, it was around Schultz Brothers, but I can't remember where. You guys really ruined so much for those of us that came after you. I just like to thank you for that. What, what, oh, the, what the listener told me was that at one point they thought it was at, at the J.C. Penney's used to be downtown. And they were people were ready to start digging a hole because they thought it was buried below J.C. Penney's or something. Oh, the yeah. cops had to break that up as well. Oh. <laughs> I remember one year I was voted to uh, hide the treasure, and so I drove all the way to Mayville. I think Jim Swarzynski drove me over there. I drove to Mayville under the cover of darkness, and I <laughs> I hid this ballpoint pin that said WBEV on it. I hid it. In the welcome sign to Mayville. <laughs> that was a good place. It did take yeah. two weeks to find it. Yeah. I think it's uh, apparently John Moser is being chased by the Blair Witch right now here on the John and Bill Project. Uh, you're, you're just uh, completely encompassed in darkness right now, John. Uh, let's play a little game for John. Uh, by the way, if John hadn't gotten his nap in today, uh, there's no way he'd be awake right now. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> John, let's play who um, who submitted this question. Ask Moser if he recalls throwing firecrackers out of my Chevy with the radio on the floor and it suddenly changed stations. Ron Knopf from Allenton, Wisconsin. Ding, 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 ding. You win. <laughs> uh, Joanne Tijeski. I met John and Bill at the Dodge County Fair when I was about four years old. They would be in the co-op building and my mom was at the AMP booth. Any good fair stories? Oh, that is a good question. Or also, best the best ever act you saw at the fair through all the years. Oh, I remember, you know, the fair uh, years ago used to have some big acts. Now, this name isn't going to mean anything to either of you, Craig's, but Myron Florin. No. Was, Be Myron Ford? Myron Florin was the uh, piano accordion. Uh, accordion player for the Lawrence Welk Band. And they would have acts of that stature. And the fair got away from that for a while. And Bill, I think you would agree that for a while there, the fair was not doing all that great, correct? It was, it was pretty much dead. Yes. Then they decided to bring some big country acts back. And um, at the very start of that, uh, Bill, you and I were asked to introduce one of the very first big country acts that I think they had. 
that. You kissed, her, you kissed her and I didn't. <laughs> it was Sylvia. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Who had a big number one hit at that point, or a big hit. I don't know if it was number one or not. But, uh, yeah, I, I just uh, kind of leaned in and gave her a big smack on the cheek. Didn't get slapped or nothing, and we got out alive, so what the heck? Probably would have been slapped with a lawsuit nowadays. <laughs> remember her big hit, John? It's on the tip of my tongue, but I can't remember it. Yeah, I just, what was it, Sue? My wife is here. What was it, Sue? Nobody. Nobody. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It was yeah, a great talk. She was number one. Yeah, she was good looking too. Yeah, she was. <laughs> By the way, how about uh I, I mean I, I just had to pull it up, but I remember Miranda Lambert. It was so it was Miranda Lambert, Jason Aldean, and Ted Nugent were all at the fair in 2008. Really? One year, all three of those. Oh. Wow. How about that? And then 2013. Had REO Speedwagon, which is when I think they set their record. No, the, I think the record was with the one country guy who just happened to hit it real big. Kobe Keith and Kobe Keith, Keith, Bryant. Yes, yes. Oh, that was then. That was later right, then, right? Or what? What year would that? Uh, what year would that have been? Toby uh, Keith would have been your era, Craig. I think because uh, that, that was like two thousand four or something, if I'm not mistaken. I remember I was working in the rotary booth making hamburgers and uh, we put our heads down at five o'clock and didn't lift them, lift them up until about nine. It was the busiest night in the, in the fair's history, I think. Well, weren't they, uh, didn't they have traffic all the way from Lund Super America all the way out to the fairgrounds? Mm -hmm. Yes. And I think that happened when they had Loretta Lynn out there too, one of the first years. Uh. That Anne-Marie Walsh says, Cripes, would you all turn your phones on vibrate? Um, let's see. <laughs> what do you mean by that? <laughs> hey, that? That's Bill's buzzing, and we learned we never tell Bill what to do. We know better. Uh, Sierra, Sierra Coon says, cheers from Mitch and Sierra Coon. Oh, the house oh full watching. Gosh. Mitch says, your, your drinks look dark. Love seeing you guys. We miss you. Oh, we miss, we, miss, we miss the Coons. We love, love, love Karen and Colin and Sierra and Mitch and yeah. uh, lo love, love the Coons. Karen, uh, Karen was like a, a mom for me when I, uh, you know, she used to make sure I, uh, I ate every day and, you know, she, I was another kid for her and Karen is, you know, one of the all time greatest ever. She was a salesperson at the radio station and uh, just a wonderful, wonderful businesswoman and a wonderful, wonderful person. And we lost her to throat cancer. And that was one of the toughest parts of my life. She was badass too. Like, you know, you had to earn it with Karen. Yeah. Um, yeah. I remember like, you know, John's one of these, like, you know, he, you know, I, I was the owner and but John just kind of like respected me and take me out on meetings and all that. It took it took a while for me to earn Karen's uh, respect because you know John she was she wouldn't bring someone on a meeting with her unless she uh, you know unless unless she really trusted you and Karen was so tough man just through through her whole cancer experience yes what a tough tough woman incredible teammate and full of love yeah and, uh, you know it, it it was very 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 rough losing her. Uh, Boy, that was tough. She was a keeper from the from day one. I mean, God, I couldn't believe she had to pass on that early. Yeah, right. And, well, and you mentioned McKinstry's, you know, loved her, her partners that she worked with, like McKinstry's, as if, yeah. you know, as if it was her money and her business. And, you know, uh, yeah, fantastic. Right. And there are so many people that, uh, you know, I've worked with through the years who have been, really had my back so many times, Laura Slosser, um, you know, Betsy worked for us for so many years. And I think, you know, there were a lot of people at the radio station for so many years, and that did something about managers like you, Craig, and owners like you. I, one thing I want to say is uh, Beaver Dam and Craig Warmbold deserves uh, so much credit for that, has, has won so many awards at the Wisconsin Broadcasters Association including Station of the Year, including New Station of the Year, and I don't even know how many times it is anymore. But that all stems from the fact that we've had owners, and Bill, I'd like you to chime in on this too, from the very beginning in the early 50s when uh, WBEV was uh, founded uh, over the years, who understood that uh, 
in order to present a product that people would be interested in, you have to be local. And in order to be local, you have to invest in people, which is the most expensive part of running any business. And Craig, you and the previous owner, John Klinger and his group and the owners prior to that all understood that and were willing to make the investment in it to maintain that localness. And that's what made the radio station what it is today. You know, when I, when I came to Beaver Dam, I could not believe the listenership that WBEV had. When I worked in Sheboygan, I never ran into anybody that listened to that station. And when I grew up in Defiance, Iowa, my mother never, ever, ever had the radio on in the morning. Never. Hmm. And I got to Beaver Dam, everybody listened to WBEV. I was so impressed, I couldn't believe it. I was just flabbergasted that wherever I went, people had WBEV on. And uh, one day I got to meet the owner of the radio station, Bill Walker. Did you ever meet Bill Walker, John? No. Bill Walker lived in Madison and he owned a number of radio stations. And, and, and Tom Walker, you know, that family still owns radio stations in Madison. It, that's still a Walker group, right, Craig? Yep. Yeah. Anyway, when I worked for Tom Fail at WBEV, Tom said, one of these days I'm going to bring in Bill Walker and uh, the guy that used to be the manager of this station, WBEV, uh, Charlie Dickoff. And I'll introduce you to those two guys. And uh, so I heard a lot about Bill Walker and Charlie Dickoff, but I had never met them. So one time they came to town and Tom Fail put them on Voice of the People. Voice of the People was on at 12.30 in the afternoon and Tom Fail was very, very controversial. I mean, if you told Tom Fail the sun comes up in the west, he'd say, nope, it comes up in the north. I mean, <laughs> very controversial, very controversial. So consequently, everybody listened to Voice of the People. Everybody listened to Voice of the People. Cripes. And so Tom Fail introduces these guys on the radio one day. And he picked up their names. Instead of Bill Walker and Charlie Dickoff, he called them, I introduce you to these two gentlemen, Charlie Dicker <laughs> and Bill Walkoff. <laughs> <laughs> I was back in my chair just laughing my ass off. <laughs> I went to Gilmore's Piggly Wiggly and uh, got a few drinks. I'm, I'm glad uh, I'm glad his name wasn't uh, Whitehead instead of Walker. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, switched the back half of that name. It might not have turned out as good uh, for Mr. Dickoff. <laughs> wow. so, oh, God. So I want to tell the story about, if I could, when uh, John Klinger sold the radio stations. Um, I had been working for John Klinger and his group for you know, how, over 20 years, right, Bill? Yeah. And John had it. I think, and, 20, uh, I think 22. 22. One day, uh, John told me, and I had been news director, program director, and then sales manager. I was a sales manager at a point. Uh, John said... Uh, John, I'd like you to meet me over in Juneau at the airport at such and such a time at such and such a day. And he didn't tell me what the reason was. And uh, well, thinking about that for a couple of days, I thought, well, maybe I did so well that he's going to give me a surprise trip to Vegas or whatever the case might be. So I drive over to Juneau and uh, they have offices in the airport facility there. And I went into the office and there was John with his partners. Uh, Rick Jaco from Elgin, Illinois, and another gentleman who owns some newspapers, as I recall. And John told me that he, John told me that he had sold the radio stations, and I just got sick to my stomach and turned pale because I'd worked for the man for 22 years. We had a great relationship, and I thought, "Oh my God, what's going to happen now?" And then he told me that this guy by the name of Craig Carmazan. Uh, bought the radio stations and he was 22 years old. I was in my mid to late 50s 
had worked at the radio station for 20 years and uh, about fell off the chair. I said, oh my God, some kid 22 years old <laughs> is going to come up here and run these radio stations. Well, I, to be totally honest, and Craig, you know this story, I've told it to you. Um, I was scared. I was frightened. I thought this is going to be the end of the world. Um, I don't wear my religion on my sleeve, but that day I came back from Juno and I stopped at church and I prayed and by golly, my prayers were answered because, uh, uh, Craig, uh, I know that you came in and, uh, you kept, you understood what localness was. You understood what we were doing and you understood that it was, uh, at that point serving the needs and wants of the community and you pretty much kept things the same. So, um, that's my story about when I heard the radio station were sold, it scared the living shit right out of me. <laughs> you were scared, John. I'm a hell of a lot older than you. <laughs> and you were there longer than me. Well, I mean, the, the thing that is amazing is once you get to Beaver Dam and you realize that all of the Milwaukee radio stations come in in Beaver Dam, all of the Madison, and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell people or if they didn't realize this, all of the Madison radio stations coming in Beaver Dam, all of the Fond du Lac stations coming in Beaver Dam. And so then here you are in Beaver Dam, and how are you going to compete with all of these stations, all this talent, all of these everything? And ultimately, the answer is like anything in radio or in, in media is you need to relate to your audience the best. And how can you do that? And how can you connect the best? you know, by being local and by being able to uh, relate to them and know them and see them around town and talk about them. And that's why, you know, what we did was, you know, at a time when everyone else was going to more computers and automation and all that, when we came in in the late 90s, we actually made WXRO more local, you know, because they had it on satellite during the day. And so we just said, hey, if we're going to make it here, we got to be local, you know, all day from six, you know, 5 a.m. till 6, 6 p.m. every day, every, you know, day and night, both stations, uh, we're going to be local because not, not because it was the right thing to do or we were trying to help anyone. It was, it was the way we were going to get people to listen to us, right? It was, it was the way to win. That's what it's all about, really. And people around here, they have learned to take it for granted that we will have local news. If you don't have local news, hell, you're not gonna you're not gonna do it. And Beaver Dam has always been committed to local news. Although I think Craig's done a little better with uh, Daily Dodge than John did trying to launch a pamphlet <laughs> newspaper, or whatever John was trying to do, running around town handing out newspapers. Or oh, it was like a mimeograph machine, wasn't it, John? That was well, that. Um... That was the days of the newscaster. And yes, when I first came to town in 1973, one of my jobs was to print a little news sheet in the morning that contained all of the highlights of the news from the day before. Now, I would type that up on, I don't know how many people have ever run a mimeograph machine, but you had to type it up on a special type of paper and then put it on the mimeograph machine, put it on that roller and make sure it's all hooked in right and then run off all of these uh, newscasters, but they came out in a sheet about a foot and a half long. So once they were printed on both sides, by the way, I had to do, I then had to cut them in half, the big sheet, so I had newscasters. Then I would get in my little Chevy Vega and run around town and deliver them to all the sponsors that Bill and the rest of the salespeople sold this to. Now, now, was that because did the Daily Citizen, was that coming out in the afternoon? So you were trying to deliver yeah. that in the morning before they got the Daily yeah. Citizen? You were trying to get them their, their, uh, their thing delivered? It, it was a smart marketing idea, and, and you guys sold it pretty good, right, Bill? Oh, yeah. I yeah. remember delivering it to Chili John's uh, <laughs> you know, when John still had Chili John's, and... Uh, one of the restaurants that advertised on it was Walker's over on the other side of town. So I'd come in with a pack of about 30 of these little newscasters and set them on the counter at Chili John's so everybody have a chance to read them. Well, 
years after I found out that after I set them on the counter, Chili John would come over, take them and throw them in the garbage can because Walker's restaurant was on. <laughs> Tom, you always had to clean your hands too. And you always wiped your hands off on the drapes, the drapes in the new room. Right? I think I think they're still there. <laughs> you kept a lot is of there, things. Is the country kitchen still open in Beaver Dam? Oh no. No, <laughs> okay. no right? No, no. Okay, I didn't want to tell this story unless uh it was I, I was 98% sure it was closed. So I was uh I was working on buying the radio station in Beaver Dam. And my mom says to me, you know, one, and, and I'm in New Jersey at this point, uh, home from college. I just uh, was graduating and about to take over the radio station. She said, a friend of mine works for some guy in a small town in Wisconsin that I think sounds like Beaver Dam. I said, I'm sure it's not. Beaver Dam's really small. She gets back to me. She's like, no, my friend works for this guy named Chuck Newman who owns a company called Water Technology in Beaver Dam. Um, and he said he'd be happy to talk to you and, uh, and tell you about Beaver Dam. So I was like, this is the best fortune I've ever had. So I call him and he says, all right, when are you coming to town? And I tell him when I'm coming. He said, all right, you got to meet me at Chili John's for breakfast. And um, I said, okay, sounds great, right? So I called John Klinger, who we're buying the radio station from. And I say, hey, I'm meeting uh, Chuck Newman. Seems pretty big time guy uh, in Beaver Dam, Newman Pools, Water Technology. That's pretty good that I got it in with him, right? That I'm gonna get to meet him. And John Klinger said, you do not set foot in uh, Chili John's. And, you know, later on, I would have thought it's because they didn't advertise or anything. He said, if you go into Chili John's, everybody knows, goes into Chili John's and everyone's going to know you're in town and no one's allowed to know you're visiting Beaver Dam because if they find out you're buying this radio station, people are going to lose their mind, you know, and we hadn't announced anything yet. So I said, all right, well, then where can I meet? And he said, the only place you can meet within 20 miles of beaver dam until we announce this deal is the country kitchen and everyone knows that food's so shitty that no one from beaver dam will see you there wow do you remember what you ate craig was it a, was it a decent meal i loved it i actually thought it was good i i recommend that uh it, that uh, whatever that chicken uh, soup was that they had at the country kitchen. That's why I'm shocked they went out of business. Yeah. This is from uh, this is from Daryl and Brenda. We are honored to know both Bill and John. They are true legends. We would like to thank them for their dedication to both the radio station and our community. And uh, then it says, ask John about the time he walked home from Madison. What? Oh, <laughs> oh my wife is here. <laughs> uh, it's a nice walk. Yeah, well, so it was a long story short, with Sue and I had a disagreement, and it was uh, early on in our marriage, and uh, we were at a wedding in Madison, and uh, east side downtown. Where are we at this wedding? <laughs> uh, on the east side, close to Visions. <laughs> <laughs> so something must have happened at Visions, and then I ended up walking home. <laughs> How far did you actually get? Uh, Pretty close to Sun Prairie, actually. <laughs> wow. This guy guy picked me up and dropped me off on uh, the intersection of 151 and 33 out on the east side out there. Did Wait. he realize he had a broadcasting legend in his car? <laughs> Wait, I, was, I, I think this may have uh, predated Uber by a few years. Uh, yeah, what really do you mean did. some guy picked you up? I, I was hitchhiking and I'd take a ride from anybody. <laughs> so you hitchhiked my Tinder? a random guy from Sun Prairie up to uh, Beaver Dam? Oh, yeah. Free grinder. <laughs> so, and this one is from uh, um, uh, from our good friends over at uh, Jack and Jill's. No, no, rechecks. Uh, this is from Brett and Jody. <laughs> Uh, tell Bill and John how, and of course the last one, uh, you know, uh, uh, from Daryl and Brenda, that's of course Gilmore's Piggly, I mean Beaver Dam <laughs> Piggly Wiggly. Uh, tell Bill and John how much they are truly appreciated by their support of local businesses. I am seriously in awe of them. Craig, the owner, has done awesome for our community. 
you are my friend and amazing. Uh, and then they make a remark about how they love all the names that uh, they get, like Jody and the Doughboys. Where did, where did Jody and the Doughboys come from? I don't know. I just started talking about Jody and the Doughboys at the barn show and caught on and been doing it for a few years. They are great partners, Jody and Brett, and they're wonderful, wonderful advertisers. You know, when uh, over an hour ago, I, was, I told you I was amazed uh, that there were three times the amount of people uh, watching than were in the building for the first time you guys did this. And I asked them uh, five minutes ago, anybody still watching? And they said, well, when you said that, um, how about now? There's over a thousand more people watching than were in the building uh, that night uh, oh. when you, you guys did that. So oh. you, it, is, uh, it is great partners and it is great uh, fans. And uh, you guys have great stamina. I mean, this is... Uh, <laughs> This this isn't just John popping in for seven thirty and eight thirty, Bill. You know, John's John's going two straight hours here. Can we take a break? I got to take a pee. The television the television said uh, when Linda looked at the TV, she said, "This thing's supposed to go to eleven o'clock." <laughs> Worst case scenario. <laughs> we thought we got Moser on the catheter for this event. No, all right, we got to take a break for him to pee. <laughs> Let's take a break then. Back in a little bit for uh, with uh, two from the road, two for the road, whatever it's called, two for the road. <laughs> Your friends at Dentistry of Wisconsin want you to know they are thinking of you and wish you good health during this unprecedented time. They look forward to seeing you again soon. But until then, sit back, relax, and enjoy the program. Anderson Real Estate is a proud sponsor of tonight's show. For all of your real estate questions, just ask Bev. She'll make sure to get you the right answers. Go online at bevandersonforrealestate.com to learn more. Enjoy the show. Pine Hills Trucking is a proud member of the community, and they feel fortunate in these challenging times to be able to keep their trucks on the road so everyone can continue to get the supplies they need. Pine Hills Trucking is pleased to sponsor this fun event. The Shores on beautiful Fox Lake is open. Carryouts are available Friday through Monday, 4 to 8 p.m. with a delivery to the Fox Lake and Randolph areas. Follow them on Facebook or visit theshoresoffoxlake.com for their menus and specials. Have fun laughing along with Bill and John. Lipke Motors in Beaver Dam is available for all your servicing needs. They can even pick your vehicle up from you and drop it back off to you after they've serviced it. Give Lipke Motors a call today at 920-887-1661. Now, enjoy more of Two for the Road. Hi, I'm Sandy. I'm Matt. From Higher Insurance. You gotta oh, it. Yeah, from Higher Insurance. And uh, we'd like to congratulate our local legends, radio broadcasters. Bill and John. And remember. When you want to retire. Call Higher. Your local Beaver Dam Piggly Hi, this is Daryl and Brenda Shanefeld from Beaver Dam Piggly Wiggly. We would like to take the opportunity to thank all of our great loyal customers who have been shopping with us during these difficult times. Last last couple months have not been very easy, but our customers have been fantastic, being patient with us while we get products on the shelf. And we'd also like to thank our loyal employees for their hard work and dedication. Together, we will get through this. Thank you. Proud to be serving Beaver Dam and the surrounding communities for over 50 years. Welcome to ReachX Food Pride. Your safety is of the utmost concern to us, so you're cart will be sanitized personally at your arrival and also when you leave. We have hand sanitizers located in four locations throughout our store, South check lanes being sanitized in between each and every transaction. Check out the definition of fresh. We receive a produce truck each and every day. Thank you for choosing ReachX Food Pride. We really do appreciate you. Stay safe, everyone. Uh-oh. I drank, I drank a whole, are we on? Well, maybe, maybe not. Why don't you finish what you were going to say? <laughs> I drank a whole bunch of my brothers-in-law. We took a van from the hotel where the wedding was down to Visions. <laughs> with the script joint. And we came back and we missed the uh, Grand March. In we missed the whole dance. Well, we missed it. Just the Grand March, and Sue was oh, yeah. Sue was not happy, so I walked home. 
And we're back here on Two for the Road uh, with John and Bill, Craig Warmbold with Craig Carmazin interviewing these guys that have a combined 104 years, I think we added up, of radio experience in Beaver Dam, uh, not counting the experience they had, well, you know, before <laughs> they, they started in Beaver Dam. And, uh, uh, you know, what, what an exciting evening it's been, Craig. It has been amazing. And, uh, I, I love hearing uh, now people know what gets talked about during the commercial break. So when you, you trick John into telling that story on the air uh, without him knowing we were back on. And, uh, we weren't on, were we? Really? Oh, no, it's fine. <laughs> you got Sue yelling at, at you to get rid of your phone. You know, now now you get the real inside scoop. It's like Fred McMurray. You, you get to see that these people really do live like uh, all of us. <laughs> um, so what? Um, Craig's about to read a bunch of questions from social media, but when when you guys started, what was uh, what was the equivalent of the social media? What not? <laughs> was it coffee was it shop? Phone? Was it uh, were you picking Painful. up? The... <laughs> Painful. Tele telegraph? Were, were were people uh, sending telegrams uh, at that time? <laughs> uh, I never got a telegram. Did you ever get one, Bill? No, no. Rumor and innuendo was about the only <laughs> yeah. way to go. <laughs> that was the most popular thing that we ever, would you agree, Bill, that we yeah. ever did? Yeah, it was. Everybody I, have, I don't remember how it started or why it started, but uh, one day I think you must have been talking about something and then somehow it turned into rumor and innuendo. And then every Wednesday, was it? Yeah, every Wednesday. 7:35 or 8:35, we would uh, spread rumors, yep. and some of them, some well, of them had do. some 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 basis in fact, and some of them did not. What were some of the rumors you spread? Uh, <laughs> well, I remember one that you spread, and we told this last year at the one night stand, was uh, Crystal Lake Skating Rink, which was out at uh, Crystal Beach. Do you remember that? Yep. Yep. Uh, was up for sale and you said <laughs> that some strip joint bought it <laughs> and uh, the real estate agent who was trying to sell it at that point oh god who I will won't name <laughs> uh, after we got off the air he came up to the radio station <laughs> and was standing at the, the front uh, reception area uh, pounding on the counter and <laughs> saying, Moser, what in the hell are you trying to do to me? I'm trying to sell this place and you're telling Beaver Dam it's going to be a script joint? <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. There was another one I thought you had. Oh, I can't remember it. But that was a fantastic program. God, everybody talked about it. Yeah, and we made stuff up. We had a good time. Pretty oh, Kumba, Kumba Hardware. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, and there's been some repercussions since uh, the one I stand we did last year. Yeah. So Kumba Ace Hardware is still in business in Beaver Dam, and it's a wonderful – Dorothy Kumba runs it. She's run it for years. And it's one of those hardware stores. It's a small place, but it's got absolutely everything. Yeah. But when you go in, the only person that can find what you're looking for is Dorothy Kumba <laughs> right. because it's spread all over and it's all stacked together and stuff. But she's got it. And uh, I we got a note last year from one of our listeners in uh, Mayville, Joan, like jo Joan Bachhuber, right? Yeah, yeah. And she sent us a note. And I think uh, uh, people around Beaver Dam will remember there was a time when, what was the big box store, Home Depot? or Depot. Home Depot? Yeah. That was in on North Spring Street. What's the company that's in there now? Uh, Metal Fab. Is it Metal Fab? I can't remember. Uh, anyway, a wonderful Mayville company's in there do now doing great business. Uh, but it, Home Depot was in there. And... The, <laughs> the note from the Mayville listener said one of the funniest things you guys ever said on rumor and innuendo was that Comba Ace Hardware drove Home Depot out of Beaver Dam. <laughs> and after, 
this year, uh, shortly after One Light Stand last year, I got a note from Dorothy. She said, I never said I drove Home Depot out of town. Well, Dorothy, <laughs> if you happen to be on the internet watching this tonight, it was, it was a note from Joan Bachhuber that said that. <laughs> we never said that you said that, but... Uh, Probably true. You probably did drive them out of town. <laughs> How would you like to take inventory of Dorothy Kumba's store? <laughs> God. I have no idea how she does that. Uh, she's great. And yeah. I've been in there a number of times and asked, you know, whatever you're looking for, she's got. Mm -hmm. So Tom, Tom Nikelski says, why is Tootie Allen felt shining shoes in the men's room? Which kind of ties into another one that we got from uh, Dave Burkhart, who wants to know, uh, how Uncle Bill selects who he recognizes at the end of the barn show. Well, uh, I do this ritual where I say uh, music selection tonight by Dave Burkhart, shining shoes in the men's room, Tootie Allenfeld, and I just go down the list. Bartenders tonight, blow Joe Blow, and <laughs> a half a dozen people or so. And one day I saw Tootie Allenfeld coming out of the hospital. And she said, Bill, make sure I am always shining shoes in the men's room. <laughs> <laughs> She's usually on there shining shoes in the men's room. But when I get requests for a barn show, uh, a request birthday or something like that, I jot down the name and then I make them a part of the barn show uh, credits at the end of the show. Shining shoes, uh, bartenders, Keeping riffraff off the dance floor, stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. So, Phil, what's what's your favorite polka? My favorite polka, I don't know. Uh, I, I really don't know. I I like them all. I like that. I like Bernie Roberts. I love Brian and the Country Dutchman. I don't know. It's hard to say. Hard to say. Who does horsey? Put your tail up. Don Peachy, Burnett. Ah, I love that song. The International Polka Hall of Famer. Yes, he is from Burnett, Wisconsin. You bet. You bet. How did the barn show get started? Well, Tom Fail, my first boss in Beaver Dam, was doing a country western show called, what the hell did he call it? Nightline to Nashville. And he did that from like 5 p.m. till 6.30. And... And after he'd get off the air, he'd go to Max Tip Top and have a few drinks. <laughs> anyway, when he sold the radio station to John Klinger, Klinger comes to town and says, God, Tom Fail sold a lot of advertising for that program. And I don't want to lose all that advertising money. What can we do? So my suggestion was try a poker show for six months. If it doesn't work, we'll scrap it and try something else. And that was, I don't know, 40 years ago or so. So that's how it all started. And it used to be two hours long. Yeah, it was. Cleaner <laughs> felt sorry for me. <laughs> well, you'd get to the station at 6.30 or 6. Yeah. You'd yeah. be there until 7 at night. Yeah, Cleaner didn't feel sorry for me. God bless him. And but you got to cut her down. I but can't believe you had such short work hours. That's great, uh, you lucky dog. Uh, yeah. Don't feel too bad. He always took a nap in the afternoon. And you got caught in Mayville one. <laughs> that was a cat nap for crying out loud. <laughs> I'll never forget that. It was during Lent. It was during Lent. And all the churches had services on Wednesday. And my Wednesday to cover Mayville, I mean, I went to Mayville every Wednesday. And I'd sneak off into this parking lot, the church parking lot, a 15-minute nap. Damn, if somebody didn't find me over there and wake me up. And <laughs> Wrapped on your window. Yeah, on my window. The McCullough, what the hell are you doing over here? <laughs> Who was it? How did he get busted, John? How did you oh, oh, I don't remember. It was a lady, I think, that found you. Yeah, I can't remember who it was. <laughs> hey, but, I mean, I, I remember, you know, you know, it's amazing. You think about Bill, how, how strong he is now with some of the health stuff that Bill was going through and not missing a day of work, you know, driving back and forth, uh, you know, chemo, radiation, whatever he was going through. I mean, that, I mean, 
That's amazing. I mean, you talk about being able to handle long days. Bill's handled the longest days for the longest time. Well, Bill, why don't you update people on how you're doing? Now, you had uh, throat cancer on your vocal cords. Yeah, it's uh, how I, you doing? I was supposed to go in for a checkup about three weeks ago, and they called me and said, oh, We're not seeing people right now unless you're hurting. Come on in. So I was gone back. But last time they uh, first I went back every three months. Now I go back every six months. And so far, so good. Well, the good news was they said right away there's a good 95% or 90% chance that, you know, they could get it and keep it for you. But I have to commend you because, I mean, during that whole series of events, when you went up to Fond du Lac to have your treatments, you never missed a day of work. And you were at work by 9, 930 in the morning. No, you couldn't be on the air. And uh, you had to make a decision. I remember the doctor told you that, uh, well, you have to decide. You can't be talking that much anymore. So you had to decide between doing the morning show on WBEV right. or the barn show on WXRO. And then uh, you had to make a very, very tough decision. And um, uh, you went on the barn show and that, that and last we had to make the tough decision also. So, you know, that's why we just cut his salary in half because he was only doing <laughs> one or two shows. Right. So, uh, right. you know, uh, I'll never forget the last show that Bill and I did in the morning. Uh, we started at seven o'clock right after the news at seven fifteen or seven twenty after the weather and sports. And we started taking calls from listeners who had been listening to Bill for all those many years and knew that this was his last morning show on WBEV. And I'll never forget, there was a lady from Oconomowoc who called, who started crying and bawling on the phone that she had grown up with Bill and listened to him all these years and wasn't going to be able to hear him anymore. And that was one of the most moving moments that I've ever experienced in radio. Well, in all seriousness, when when we heard and you know that Bill had cancer, it was like, you know, crushing. And then you hear it's throat cancer, you know, for Uncle Bill with the voice. And you're like, you know, and, and you figure when you hear that, all right, you know, his his radio career is over, but how long ago was that now, Bill? Uh, I think that's going on four years ago. And that's really crazy. The doctor tells you you have vocal cord cancer. God, I'll never forget that night. It was in December, right before Christmas. <clears throat> and uh, I had been to Madison to get my throat checked out, my vocal cords. And I knew the doctor was going to call tonight. And the phone rings. And I'm sitting at my kitchen table. And I didn't answer it. I said, I, I'm not up to hearing the results. And so he left a message. And it was the message that I had vocal cord cancer, but I didn't listen to the message till about three hours later. I was probably drinking some courage. I don't know. <laughs> and I got enough guts up to listen to it. And he said, you know, early stages, I think we can get it all. And uh, and he said, you're going to have to go through radiation. And I didn't want to drive to Madison every day for radiation. So I asked him if I could transfer to uh, Fond du Lac, and God, that was wonderful. Driving to Fond du Lac every day was great compared to driving down to Madison. So, yeah, that was going on like four years ago. So, so far, so good. We got a uh, lot of social media responses here. Um, Glenn Link, uh, former alderman in Beaver Dam, yeah. uh, wants to let you know that Brett Link is watching from Oakland, California. He still listens to the barn show as often as he can. <laughs> he plays it at his store. If he is there when it's on, he gets some strange reactions. <laughs> California. <laughs> Oakland, California. Uh, I've known Glenn Link forever. And I remember he was at City Hall and really a good guy. And uh, Glenn, I appreciate your friendship. Thank you. Jim Derivan wants to know, what about the song on the jukebox at Pork and Twinks? There's a name I've never heard before. Pork and Twinks. What the hell is that? Somebody just asked me last week, have you played 128 lately at Pork and Twinks? I said, nope. The bar in Fox Lake. Yeah. It used to be. What is the song, Bill? 
The name of the song, I will not repeat the last word. The name of the song is, it's by Jimmy Buffett. <laughs> let's, let's get drunk and... <laughs> Pork and twinks. Yes, and Bill would use that on the radio, and we'd talk about 128 up at Bill uh, Pork and Twinks, yeah. you know, once a week. <laughs> Let's get drunk and blank. <laughs> Kyle Grotenheis. Kyle Grotenheis says, We're watching in Lipsick. Grandpa Danny P just told us the story of how Bill gave him the nickname Danny P while they were in the service together. Uh, I gave him the nickname. That's what he says. My memory is going bad. Uh, boy, I remember being in the service with that rascal, but I don't remember how Danny P came about. I'm sorry, Danny, I don't remember that. You got to refresh my memory. Tina Swain says at our cottage in Beaver Dam Lake, if I could have two more brothers, it would be Bill and John. If I could have two more sons, it would be Craig times two. Oh, that's sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Shanewetter, my couch in Beaver Dam would like to hear more from John and Bill and less from me. Sorry. <laughs> our, our kitchen oh. in Beaver Dam. Uh, living room and loving it. Thanks. I used to listen to the barn show as well as a uh, family ate dinner when I was young. You know, you had so many people that we, like we were talking before the generations that have, uh, have watched and, or I should say, listened to, uh, to you guys over the years. It wasn't just school closings. No, yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah, for a lot, it was though. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Jacob Nails, Bob Schwant wants to know how you enjoyed the Dodge County Fair riding a cart being pulled by an ostrich. That's not on our list. We don't have the ostrich story on our list anywhere. You rode on a, you rode in a cart being pulled by an ostrich. Is this a true story? Are you talking to me? I don't know who I'm talking to. It must have been after 10 o'clock because I have no clue what the hell he's talking about. The only animal I remember riding at the Dodge County Fair was an elephant. Oh, and man, that thing is like, ah, I couldn't believe it. It was like riding on a wire brush. Man, is that sucker hard to ride? I'm sitting on that elephant, and I'm not kidding you. It was like a wire brush. I couldn't wait to get off. That's all I remember. I don't remember an ostrich. Lori Reed. I, I think the most exciting night we had at the fair bill, and were you and I doing the broadcast? We always broadcast, and we still do. The animal auction, the uh, meat mar uh, the market animal sale yeah. on Thursday night. Yeah. And one year the pig got out of the out of the uh, fence and started running around in the audience. Was that when Julius Timken jumped out yeah. of the? I kind of remember that. <laughs> you remember uh, Beaver Dam Raceway? Yeah, we used to broadcast time trials at the Beaver Dam Raceway. Yeah. The only radio station on the face of the earth that would broadcast time trials because it's one car going around the track and that was it, but it was sold. And, you know, Hal Woods was the owner. The races were on Tuesday nights. I remember the... Uh, area we broadcast from was a booth that they had set up in the infield where they would do the timing and the announcing and the like. And we were in there with our microphone and cord. And I remember following these guys around the track and getting the cord all twisted up around my ankles because yeah. I was just going round and round. Yeah. But, uh, and I remember there was one driver, Arnie Schmidt from mm -hmm. Beaver Dam. Yeah. And I always called Arnie the man from Beaver Dam Schmidt. And yeah. one night, he uh, was doing the time trials, and when he got across the finish line, his brakes didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> there was a woods down at the end of the track, and he went off into the woods. And I re all I do I remember saying is, "There goes Arnie, the man from Beaver Dam Schmidt." Oh my God, he's going in the woods. <laughs> it, it turned out he was okay, and nobody got hurt real bad. He used to have a service station here in in town. Yeah, yeah South Spring Street. John, yeah. I remember, wasn't there a guy who uh, who bought that and was going to try to turn it into like a NASCAR track? You know, try to... Oh, Gary, and I forget his last name. Yep. Uh, yeah. That's yeah. how we started uh, racing in the summer. You know, yeah. that was yeah. when he came yeah. into town. 
He yeah. had a huge event out there. What do they call that where they jump over stuff and special cars that they built? I forget what it was, but he was looking for uh, a place to have an awards ceremony for this huge event that he was having there. He went to the Chamber of Commerce who said, yeah, we'll put an event together for you at Swan Park. And that event started out as an award ceremony for Gary's um, event. And then after a while, the event kind of went away and the chamber volunteers went away. And then it was called Race in the Summer. And then the radio station, and it, Craig, you were in on the decision to do it, uh, decided to go in and uh, take the event over. Correct? Yep, exactly. Exactly. By the way, we have our uh, faithful engineer here, uh, Craig, who uh, I don't know if you've given credit. You know, this was supposed to be a one hour broadcast he signed up for, and he's uh, he's hard at work almost two and a half hours in here. Well, I know how you love uh, being able to afford overtime to all of the uh, employees at Good Karma <laughs> Brands. So that's, I think, what, what, what is driving this whole, uh, I think this is like not only part two, but part three we've now officially uh, gone into. I've, I've got one, one final question here uh, from our social media that I wouldn't mind getting to. Um, and uh, I think it's uh, rather appropriate and perhaps a good way to start to wind things down. I've just got to find it, as I say, because this is from. We don't need uh, to wind down. I just want to give Justin some love. I mean, I mean, you know, you, you, you know how are you not giving uh, our guy Justin some love? He's got Tim's name under him. So people think he's Tim the whole time. You know, you got to get him some love. Oh, nobody could see him. That's OK. I thought you were talking about many of our engineers. Oh, I thought you were talking about oh, so Jody and and everybody back at the ranch. Oh, so so he's hidden. I thought he I thought he was like the kind of secret uh, engineer who's just there all night that people could see. OK, so only we can see him. Only only we could see. He's the man behind the curtain. Craig. Yeah, so you don't want to give him any credit, though. Oh, you know, his, his name is Ninja. And let me tell you, he is a fierce competitor with that uh, sword. <laughs> he, he, nobody comes close to the work that he does, either with the sword or with the information technology computer side of things. Our hats off to you, Ninja, for everything you've done tonight. Yes. For your patience with us old coots who don't understand technology. So, so basically, uh, uh, Jody and Brett and Daryl and Brenda, you know, from Jack and Jill's and Gilmore's, uh, I'm, again, I mean, Beaver Dan, Piggly Wiggly and uh, Rechecks Food Pride. Uh, they want to know if there might be a uh, part three. I don't know what we would call that. Uh, awkward three somewhat, John and Bill, whatever we would call it. Uh, is there going to be a part three? My understanding was last year was one night stand. Tonight is the last stand. <laughs> oh, is, is, that, is that how it was sold? Okay. <laughs> I'm using all my material up here. <laughs> what about you, Bill? I don't know that I have that I have many more stories to tell. I do have a couple. <laughs> I've got a lot here still on the sheet. <laughs> See, I think I think uh, I think these guys uh, have more in them, but I think there's a lot of other uh, teammates uh, here in Beaver Dam that uh, have some pretty good stories as well. Uh, you know, we've thrown out some of the names tonight. Uh, I bet I, I bet you they have. Uh, there's there's some others with some good stories uh, who can who can entertain as well. Absolutely. Yeah, but, but that doesn't mean you guys are off the hook. You guys have to be part of the show. Did I ever tell you guys the story about <laughs> when we hired Tom Dome from uh, South Dakota? I don't know if I ever told that story. I don't think you have. It's not even on the list. <laughs> Tom Dome was working in South Dakota, and he was a Wisconsin. He grew up in Wisconsin, and he was looking for a job to get to get it back to Wisconsin. And so we hired Tom Dome here in Beaver Dam. And this goes back to about 1965, 66 probably. And Tom and his wife, Lynn, they moved back here in a, like a gremlin, a smaller type car. And they pulled a U-Haul that was apparently overloaded because he wore out a set of tires driving to Beaver Dam from South Dakota. And so anyway, Tom came to work and he was a good, we, he and I got to be really good friends. And uh, he was working a Saturday shift. I was working a Saturday morning shift. And 
Tom failed that morning. The manager told me that he had to go to Madison that day. So I don't know why he told me he had to go to Madison, but I knew Tom Fail was out of town. And so in the control room, there were two doors. You could enter two different ways. You walk out one door, you could walk in around the other door. But if you walked in this door on the left side, there was a big panel of meters where the engineers had put, but you know, when the meters are going back and forth, when the announcer's talking, the meters are going like that. And when the announcer stops talking, the meters are dead. So I thought, Tom Fail is out of town. I'm gonna play a trick on Tom Dome. So I say, Tom, have a good weekend. I'll see you next Monday. And I walk out this door. And he's doing the obituaries. So I'm thinking, oh, I better not pull this trick off now. I better wait till he does the sports. So I walk <coughs> back to the other room, to the other part of the room, and I wait until he's doing the <coughs> doing the uh, sports. And I open the door, and there's a fire extinguisher right by the door. And I pick that sucker up, and I sneak in the other door, and I walk up behind him, reading the sports, and I hit that uh, fire extinguisher, go, woof, and that sucker made a hell of a noise. I mean, it was just loud. It looked like the place blew up. And I'll bet Dome jumped off his chair that far. I mean, he jumped. <laughs> looked at the meters and now they're dead because he's not talking and he says son of a bitch we're off the air <laughs> <laughs> and when he says that I says stop 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 stop, stop. and he can't hear me because he's still getting the results of this big boom <laughs> and he says god damn we're off the air <laughs> Tom Shut up, turn your mic off. <laughs> mic off. He turns around and he says, McCollum, what the hell are you doing? What's going on? <laughs> Tom, Tom, I'm playing a trick on you. What do you mean you're playing a trick on me? I said, I got this damn fire extinguisher. I just wanted to scare you. He says, get the hell out of here. We're both going to get fired. I says, Tom, nobody's going to get fired but me. If anybody gets fired, it will not be you, it'll be me. So <laughs> I waited for Tom Fail to call. All day I waited for Tom Fail to call. <laughs> Monday morning, I'm walking into the station on eggshells. <laughs> Tom Dome comes in and we look at each other and we're thinking, wow, what's gonna happen? Tom Fail never ever said a word. I don't know if we didn't have any listeners at the radio station that Saturday. Tom, I know, didn't hear it. He was in Madison, but no repercussions for that. God, Dome never forgave me for that. He was so <laughs> off. God, he was mad at me. I can't blame him, I guess. Are there any swear words that you guys would like to just say now randomly because you're not on the actual airwaves and uh, this is FCC protected? You just want to let some rip? Is there anything you haven't been able to I think to they've let life? them all rip already tonight. But I, by the way, I remember the first time I went out for a drink with uh, John. Um, oh. <laughs> and, well, and and the bill, the bill came to six seventy five, <laughs> and so I put down a ten. And he says, "What are you doing?" And I was like, "Well, I was thinking I should give like five, but I don't have the change." He's like, "No, no, no! What are you? You shouldn't give more than a dollar tip. What are you trying to embarrass us all here?" <laughs> <laughs> and, that's, and that's when I realized how uh, generous and giving uh, John Moser was. Hey, John. Hey, John. Yeah. What about Walter? Oh, about Walter. Uh, Tell us about Walter. Uh, Walter was, uh, this is an Allenton story where I'm from. Uh oh. And uh, my mother, Annabelle, called me after I did this. Uh, Walter was, uh, and I'm not going to use his last name because his family is just a wonderful family. He was a patriarch of the family, a wonderful white-haired 
older gentleman that had a unique way of talking and a unique way of uh, expressing himself. And uh, he was widely known in Allenton. And uh, I remember him and my dad talking on the church steps after mass on Sunday mornings all of the time. But uh, he, <laughs> when our family would get together, we'd talk about Walter and the way, and the way he presented himself, the way he talked. And again, he was a wonderful gentleman, his family, a good, hardworking family. But Walter had this unique way of expressing himself. And he would say things like, uh, well, that John Moser, that damn kid, they, he, <laughs> I, I ain't going to say he's lazy, but he ain't going to want to work unless there's a steering wheel and a seat involved with it. And if he's on a tractor and that's okay. <laughs> and, that kid, and that kid, he can spread more bullshit with his mouth than you can with a manure spreader in a whole week. <laughs> and then, and then he's got the the guts to call me old. I will tell that kid, just cause there's snow on the roof, don't ain't, mean there ain't no fire in the furnace. <laughs> and I did something not like that, but close to that, right, Bill? Yeah, yeah. On the air one morning, and my mother, God bless her soul, was listening over in Allenton, and she called me up right after the show, and she said, John, what in the hell are you doing? Those people might be listening to you. But I never heard any other repercussions from that. So. How about that? From uh, We've heard a lot of uh, being worried about the managers. Any other times where any family members... Uh girlfriends, wives, uh, where you got yourself into trouble uh, with uh, what you talked about on the air? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> not. Not until tonight when you uh, talked yeah. about your trip to Madison? Yeah, the vision story. <laughs> yeah, right. uh, the best luck we ever had in Madison was we never ran into any roundabouts. <laughs> yeah, we always got home. <laughs> Going to Madison with John, I was always about 0 for 4. He was about 1 for 2. <laughs> he, was five, he was a 500 hitter and I was 0 for 0. Oh, that's that's incorrect. <laughs> Brett Recheck wants to know about uh, John Lauer, what he said about the commercials. Uh, ask Bill. John Lauer was always jealous of how Bill did my father's commercials. Oh, yeah. John Lauer would hear me talking about uh, Jerry Recheck, and uh, he would say, good God, Jerry, that guy on the radio, he doesn't read a commercial for you. He, he does a testimonial. <laughs> what the hell? How, how do you get, how do you do that? But, uh, you know, that's the way, that's the way I felt about Jerry, and I did a testimonial for him. Great advertiser, Jerry Recheck. Great guy. <laughs> Well, that, I mean, and, and Brett's kept it up. Like you've seen those those guys be honored as uh, top workplaces, you yeah. know, in in the entire uh, region, you know. So amazing what what they've done. Yeah, these grocery stores in Beaver Dam, Brett Recheck and uh, Daryl, they're they're wonderful wonderful partners, and I'm telling you, I wouldn't want to be in business without them. You know, yeah, it's so hard to single people out, but. Uh, you know, we've been so fortunate, and uh, Craig I, and Bill, I know, and Craig Wormbull, you'd agree that uh, our businesses have been so supportive of uh, the radio station over the years that whatever success we've had is due to those businesses that allow us to be on the air to gain the listenership that helps those businesses. It's a win 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 situation. And uh, this community has been so good to all of us individually and as a business over the years that I can't, I can't express my appreciation enough. Well, well think it, about it. Think about it for us as a company, you know, we started uh, in Beaver Dam, you know, uh, December 2nd, 1997. And uh, this past, you know, October 1st, uh, 2019, you know, our company took over ESPN Chicago. <laughs> like, I mean, th think about that, you know, to, to grow from uh, starting in Beaver Dam and, 
everything we learned in Beaver Dam and the way, you know, we've talked so much and always talk so much about all our advertising partners, but all these people wouldn't be advertising if all these other people weren't listening and then supporting those advertisers. Right. So like you said, John, it is a win, win, win. And, um, you know, and then our company owes so much of what we've learned, you know, to you guys and, you know, and to the people of Beaver Dam who, uh, who got us started uh, in this business uh, 23 years ago. I remember when you first came to town, Craig, uh, you know, with John Klinger, I had an open door relationship. I could walk in and out of his office anytime. And you were in there with the door closed and I had no damn clue what the hell you were up to, but look at what you've grown this into and congratulations to you. And it's a, uh, it's been an honor to work for you, to be honest with you. With, I, got, I got no smoke to blow up anybody's butt at this point. I could be totally retired if I want to, but you've been great for the community. You've been great for our business. Thank you. Well, thank yeah. you. But that, that's because we were planning that, uh, you know, after I came into town and said, oh, we're not going to change anything. We're going to keep everything the same. And then we took WYKY. You know, a short <laughs> nine months later and put Howard Stern on the radio. We oh. had a discussion about that, didn't we? Yeah. And and John lost his mind when he heard we were going to do that. And I just remember the day that uh, when Bill came in and told me, he's like, yeah, I've been starting to listen to him a little. And you'd be surprised how many people in Beaver Dam are listening to him now. They Most of them won't admit it, but they're listening now. They're checking it out. <laughs> hey, John, how about uh, John Klinger and uh, Bill, John? This morning, we reached an all-time low. <laughs> you tell that story? Uh, John Klinger was a great boss. And you know what? He, he understood localism and Beaver Dam. And I'll never forget one thing he told me. He said, you know when you run out of stuff to say on the radio, get the phone book out and start reading names. Because that's local. And people will wonder why you're reading those names off and they'll recognize the names. But you and I were on the air one morning. What was the content? What were we doing, Bill? You had a, uh, we'd look up a word in the dictionary and I'd ask you the definition of this word. And uh, it was bung, right? I think it was bungle or something like that. Yeah. And I started reading down the list of words. Right. And I came to bung hole. Bung hole. <laughs> You came to bunghole and we both started laughing. Bunghole. <laughs> and I read the definition or something. And there are, you know, I can count on one hand the number of times that you get a laughing jag on where you can't stop laughing. Yeah, yeah, that was one day. And you and I started laughing. <laughs> and then uh, you and I were called into Mr. Klinger's office. And why don't you tell the rest of the story? Oh, no, no. He came into the control room oh, when I was getting off the air. And that's what he said, John. Bill, this morning, WBEV has reached an all-time low. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm trying not to laugh. I busted out laughing. Yeah, you did. <laughs> now Clinger's pissed. <laughs> and boy, he read us the riot act. Yeah, he did. Man. Yeah, Craig, you didn't know that uh, John and Bill were uh, Beavis and Butthead uh, before <laughs> Beavis and Butthead laughing at uh, bunghole jokes. No, but that was one of the stories that I told at my family's Thanksgiving in suburban Chicago. <laughs> I went to my sister's house this past November for Thanksgiving, and it was immediate family. And um, my sister's uh, a boyfriend invited some friends over. And, uh, I, you know, I was talking to my mom about something and she mentioned WBEV and Beaver Dam and, and the, the, the woman there said, uh, well, what did you just say? I, I said, oh, I was just talking about where I work in Beaver Dam. She said, no, what did you say WBEV and Beaver Dam? And it is John Klinger's stepdaughter here at this Thanksgiving function. Oh, and so, wow. so then these stories all came pouring out. Essentially. <laughs> I'm like, do you know about the bunghole story? Do you know about this? <laughs> But it was wonderful meeting her. You know, the Clingers have been great and they've been great yeah. members of the uh, the community. And, yes. uh, you know, they really laid the foundation for the uh, the modern WBEV as we uh, as we know it. Absolutely. John Clinger believed in local news and local, local, local. That was John Clinger. He yep. Did a good job. yep. And Craig continued the tradition. Indeed. So, um, 
you know, it, it seems like we're kind of winding things down here. Uh, 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 John, Bill, if you had like a, a final message that you would want to send our listeners off with tonight, tonight. Wait, uh, what, what's, what's John got going over there? <laughs> well, can I do the EBS thing? You've got an EBS thing. The I don't, EBS that's test? not even on my notes. Oh, it, our own version of the EBS test. What does EBS yeah. stand for? No, Emergency I Broadcasting want, System. I think our listener, anybody who listens to the radio is familiar I think, what do they call it now, Craig Wormbold? I think uh, it's AS, the emergency AS, alert system. Emergency alert system, right. It used to be called the emergency broadcast system, which is the EBS. And Bill was talking about the teletypes uh, a lot. When we first started our conversation this evening where these machines with big things like you used to see in a typewriter would be hitting the paper and you hear ding, 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 ding. Well, you'd get a message across that every once in a while that would say, and then you had to read it on the air when all those bells went off uh, that would say, this is a test of the emergency broadcast system. Had this been an actual emergency, you would have been instructed, yada, 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 yada. And Bill and I always wanted to do our own version of the EBS test, which was, this is not a test of the emergency broadcast system. This is an emergency. Bill and John have left the building <laughs> and are headed north at a high rate of speed. <laughs> it is time for everyone to take shelter and go into a crouching position. <laughs> Put your head between your knees and kiss your ass goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right on, John. <laughs> we got to yeah, dig that up out of the it. archives. I, I'd like to conclude tonight. <laughs> well, hey, Craig. Yeah. Or other Craig. How, how times have changed. How times have changed. Back in the mid 60s, I covered the Beaver Dam School Board. And uh, I got to meet Don Durst. He was the, oh. bean, he was the bean counter at uh, the Beaver Dam School District. So I got to know Don. And he invited me to his Christmas party. And so I got off the air that night, went to his Christmas party over on Cleveland Street and had a few beers, didn't eat any food, which I should have done. And I get in my car about an hour and a half later and I go home. Cripes. And I'm going to the farm, speeding probably about 10 miles, 15 miles over the speed limit. Pretty soon the old gumball machine goes on, and sure as hell, Beaver Dam cop stops me. And back then, you could get out of the car and walk back to the cop car, which I did. Luckily for me, the cop knew me. He said, Bill, where are you going? I said, I'm going home. He said, where do you live? I said, right over there. He said, are you sure you're going home? I said, yeah. He said, where you been? I said, I went to a Christmas party. How many beers have you had? I said, two, maybe three. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you sure you're going home? I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to follow you down there. I'll give you a break. I'm going to follow you to your house. And you better pull in your driveway, park your car, and I'm driving back here in an hour, in two hours, and in three hours. And if your car is gone, I'm going to pull out an all-point bulletin for your butt. I parked my car. I thanked him. I stayed home that night. <laughs> hey, I sent that Beaver Dam cop a thank you note. <laughs> Boy, how times have changed, huh? Really, they have. Man. Yeah. That's the way it used to be. I mean, we got this, we got this note from, from Tim Mentheus. Um, tell Sue to have John call the Verizon Wireless Zone in Beaver Dam when you open it. When we open on Monday, we will help him get his phone on vibrate. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> I tried, and it just keeps dinging off. <laughs> My wife Seriously. hollered at me already for it. Craig, I mean, you know, what a pleasure it's been listening to t these two guys, huh? I, I think it's amazing. You know, you think about all of the things that the country's gone through in the last uh, 
month and a half and how everyone feels so like separated and you know confined and all this stuff based on what's going on and then you see how these two guys can just make you feel all together and you realize that like they've created their own community over time and when you hear them tell those stories you're not separated and you're not you know you're kind of all in this little john and bill world just like kind of sitting back and uh and listening uh to stories that you still haven't heard uh you know you've heard some for the thousandth time and then there's one of them that you you, you never heard so i mean it's just uh you know there's comfort foods uh that people have and uh there's there's certain things that make you feel a certain way but just you know being here tonight it's it's kind of that feeling of normalcy and that everything's all good and that we're we're kind of all here uh together so these guys are amazing you know when when we ran through uh the schedule on wednesday i think it was eight o'clock that uh this was scheduled to wrap up and uh if if craig wasn't such a wimp uh these guys would uh, be taking it straight till midnight tonight so <laughs> i'm here all night I've, yeah. i'm here all night what do you yeah, need so uh <laughs> no, they, they are amazing and uh craig thanks to you justin and Joey said and jody and ryan gable uh you know and you know taylor uh, taylor everybody who uh you know i don't know who else i'm missing but we're missing uh, a people. lot of people we apologize you know, it's hard to uh to make this possible but it's it's an it's amazing advertising partners that we've been talking about amazing listeners and uh you know and then it's uh it's you guys who are just uh just awesome Absolutely. You know, after the one night stand at the Beaver Dam Mary Community Theater Fine Arts Center just about one year ago, um, this uh, this event concluded with a standing ovation. Um, I would like to invite all of our uh, listeners, all of our viewers, everybody that's watching at home right now to give a virtual standing ovation to John and Bill. Well, why don't we do that right now? <laughs> John and Bill, thank you so much for everything you do. We really appreciate it. You are the best. Everything has been great. Thank you so much for everything that you've done. <laughs> nice words, Craig. I, I, I can't thank you enough, and I hope you have a great day. Well, if you're going to show your shorts, I'm going to show my pee bottle. <laughs> <laughs> no, least, seriously, uh, it's been wonderful. At least some of us are, are wearing something <laughs> below the waist. <laughs> <laughs> two for the road it's been too much fun uh thank you again craig uh thank you for making this uh this event possible um john you know uh what is it third thir 46 47 years that you've put in bill 57 years the the 104 years that you've put in between you has been an inspiration to this next and generation Dan, Piggly Wiggly and rechecks food pride and all of the other sponsors or, or Jack and Jill's and Gilmore's, whatever you want to call them. Beaver Dam, Piggly Wiggly, Jack and Jill's, Rechecks, whatever whatever you want to call it. We do thank you for uh, for sponsoring tonight, right? And Craig, thank you for paying us. <laughs> <laughs> That's helpful. Yeah, I'll, I like I'll to second speak. that. <laughs> yeah. I'll second that. So I, how, do you, how do we end a video stream? I don't know. This hereby concludes the- You say uh, this has been, this is, if this, uh, this has, is an actual emergency and John and Bill are leaving <laughs> and they're driving north. So uh, shove it up your ass or whatever they said. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Night. I think that's the end. Good night. <laughs> Good night. Love you guys. Good night. Drive Love safe, you. everyone. Tip your waitresses. <laughs> yeah. Virtual tip.